the East Coast to join us during his one week of break before summer school, summer school starts as well. So if you're not familiar, this is an American Statistical Association traveling course that the Hawaii chapter um, basically applied for and was awarded last year. The American Statistical Association tries to get the best of the best in whatever topic, whatever the field is, and recruits them, I guess, in a way, <laughs> to go around the country to some of the chapters if they apply and are awarded and share information, you know, educate people out in the states, okay? So that's what's happening here. They're the main sponsor. I also really want to thank, um, if you saw the cover sheet, there are quite a few co-sponsors at UH. Um, part of that is because we end up, my understanding is from these co-sponsors, we end up doing a summary, which is very helpful for them to show that their money was you know, well spent. And so we really appreciate you completing that one page evaluation form. The top of it is super easy to fill out, if you'll notice. It's um, all factual things, like you know, your gender and stuff. And then it gets a little more, you know, wants to know what you think. But I really appreciate you filling those out and leaving them before the end of the day, either on the table where you are or back at the registration desk where you picked up the handout. Um, either of those places is fine. So Chris Schmidt is here from Brown University for two days. Today, evidence synthesis, tomorrow, meta-analysis. This is his last traveling course. He did all his others already. Like I said, we were awarded over a year ago. It takes that long to um, coordinate something and get all the co-sponsors. And he really is top of the field in this area. If you Google him, you will see that. Um, he's currently at Brown and was previously at Tufts. He was on the Big Island for several days before coming here. And he will be on Oahu for many, uh, several more days if you want to give him ideas on what to do, places to see. Please give a big hand for Chris Brown. He fits right in, right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, no, I've never given, I've never given a talk in LA before, so this will be interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, so welcome, I'm glad to be here. Um, as uh, um, Tammy said, they, they didn't have to twist my arm too hard to, to come give a talk in Hawaii. I've never been here before, so I've been really enjoying my time. Um, this is a two day um, program for me. I, I know a lot of you are gonna be here on the second day. Um, today is the non-technical day, or the way I think about it, the non-Greek the non letter day. Um, no statistics today. I'm gonna wanna, wanna talk to you just today about how you basically set up one of these reviews. And um, so let me say a little bit about myself. I'm at, I'm at Brown. Uh, right now I'm in the, in the biostatistics department and I'm also part of the Center for Evidence Synthesis and Health. Um, we go around and do um, evidence syntheses for, we do contracts for the government um, and we also um, do a lot of education. Um, oops, okay, first problem. How do we get down to the next slide? <laughs> All right, Let's, we are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works. All all that works when I hit it is I get I get a bang, a boom. All right. Okay, back back to where we were. Okay, so this this course is part of a grant that, and these are just acknowledgments that we we've been working on for the last few years. And so I wanna um, give a shout out to two of my colleagues, Kristen Denko and, and Ian Saldana, who actually developed this course. Um, last year we taught it at the CDC. I usually do the, the technical meta-analysis courses, so I'm, I'm using their slides here mainly and made a few modifications um, for, the, for the systematic review part. Um, so here's a little bit about us. Um, as I said, we, we have an evidence-based practice center that's funded by the government. And um, it's, a, it's a group of people, about 20 or 30 people who, who do these systematic reviews. And so I'm gonna talk to a little bit about some of the, some of the studies we do. Now this is gonna be mainly, um, I'm coming from a health background. I worked in a hospital for 20 years and I've been at Brown for seven. Um, so a lot of the examples are gonna be health related. I know not everybody in here is in the healthcare field. So I've tried to put in a few other examples of things, but if you've got questions you know, during the day or you know, how does this apply to, to my work, please ask me, you know, at any time. Um, <clears throat> most of this is pretty generic, so I think it's going to apply really to any 
uh, field you're in. So what we do um, at our evidence synthesis center is we use research and tools to develop research evidence for decision makers. So in the healthcare field, um, let's say you have, you're developing a new um, treatment or you wanna see how an exposure, environmental exposure has an effect on, on health. Um, there's a lot of interested, people interested in that type of question, right? There's people in the government who need to make policy. There are people in companies who are making business decisions. There are people in insurance companies who are making choices about what to pay for. There's patients and consumers, all kinds of people. And these are, these are the stakeholders of this, of this problem. And so what we are trying to do is we're trying to develop systems where people can read our reports or, or talk to us and make rational decisions. Um, and so what we, we're, we're trying to do is to come up with ways of teaching these principles so that people who are not technical experts or not scientists necessarily, but need to, to read the literature um, can appreciate it. And that's sort of where I'm coming from today. And, and there's some, there's some uh, hyperlinks here if you want to go to some of our websites. We have a, an evsynthacademy.org, which um, has some nice online training materials that will cover a lot of this as well, um, and then our website. So what I want to do today is I want to um, tell you and, and help you realize why you need to use systematic review and meta-analyses when, when, it's, when it's useful um, and, and what uh, principles to, to work off of to understand the process that you go through in doing a systematic reviews and the methodologies that you would use to be, so that you're able to critically read the literature, interpret evidence, and um, therefore support decision making in, in, in our sense, in our case, healthcare delivery and health policy, but in, in any other field, whether it's ecology or criminal justice or, or um, education or psychology, the, this, this has wide application. So just replace the word healthcare there with whatever your field is. And with additional support, hopefully you can undertake a basic systematic review or meta-analysis yourself. And I'll try to tell you who the people are that you should, um, you should get to, to work with you on that. So, Here's an outline of today. I'm hoping to be able to get through all this material. As you see, there's a lot of slides, so we'll see how far we can get. Um, so I'm gonna start off with just an introduction to the, to the area. What is evidence synthesis? Why do we use it? Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the different steps of doing a systematic review. So the first one is preparing the topic that you wanna talk about. This is um, basically means how do you set up your team and, and how do you figure out what you actually wanna study? Um, then you need to formulate your research question because some questions are gonna to be too broad and some questions are gonna to be too narrow. And we'll talk about ways of formulating the question to make it something that you can actually get something useful out of. Then we'll talk about how to find the studies that are in the literature and how to search for them and how to screen them out and find out what the important ones are. Then we'll talk about, well, once you've got those studies, how do you extract the data from them? What do you need to take, take out? The next step is important. It's assessing the risk of bias. That means basically how how good are the studies? What's their quality? What, what do you need to know about them to be able to use them effectively? Then we'll talk about how to synthesize the information, first from a qualitative point of view, and secondly, from a quantitative point of view, which is the area of meta-analysis, which is the topic for tomorrow. And then finally, how you pull it all together into a report. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic outline of the day. All right, so starting off with an introduction. We're going to try here to discuss what is evidence synthesis, what are its basic components uh, of a systematic review, who are the potential users of a systematic review, um, how the review might be used. We'll provide some examples of reviews and some practical considerations. So this is just a very broad overview um, just to give you an idea of where we're coming from. <clears throat> okay, so the idea of evidence synthesis is you have a lot of information out there. We all know that there are many, many studies and many, many commentaries being produced every day. There's no way that we can all, you know, keep up with the literature. Um, so meta-analysis systematic reviews are very useful because they're summaries of the evidence and they can allow us to look at that summary and say, okay, what's been done, and what hasn't been done. So it allows us to combine and analyze the information to learn what is known about a topic and whether that information is actually valid. You've probably all heard about, you know, you read the paper and one day coffee is good for you and the next day coffee is not good for you, right? Depends on who does the study. And that's really what we're talking about is these studies are done in a variety of ways. Um, and some of them are well done and some of them are not well done, right? And so 
Studies that are not well done can have potential bias and they may lead to the wrong answer. And so that may be that one of these studies that gets publicized may actually just not, not have done the right kind of um, analysis and, or, or they might have collected the wrong information or they might have done their study poorly. Um, in other cases, um, studies may vary in their outcomes. And so by putting them together, we get an overall broad picture of what's going on. Okay, so there's an information overload. Um, the idea is a lot of these studies are very small. <clears throat> and for those of you who know a little bit of statistics, you'll know that when you have small studies, um, we don't necessarily have enough power um, to get an accurate estimate, right? So if you have, um, let's say there's a big effect out there and you actually find a big effect, but you, your study is too small, there's too much uncertainty in that estimate of that effect. And so you might conclude that there's not sufficient evidence that there's a, that there's a difference between two things. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's no difference, although people often interpret it that way. But if you have a lot of these little studies and you put them together and they're all fairly consistent, then in the end, you might actually figure out what's going on, right? If I consistently figure out that every car that's going by this building is blue, right, then eventually I might think that all cars are blue. Um, if I only have one or two cars, I can't make that, that decision. Um, another use of, use of evidence synthesis is to explain discrepancies. So why do some studies come up with one answer and some studies come up with another? I've already mentioned this idea that some of the studies may be poorly done, but even when the studies are well done, they might come up with different answers. And you can think of probably some reasons why that might be. There might be some, some populations of individuals for whom uh, a particular exposure is important and other people for whom it isn't, right? The drug might work in some people and not in others. Um, if you're in, in an educational environment, it might work well if you're teaching rambunctious boys, but not if you're teaching quiet girls. Or it might work well with, with athletic girls and not with non-athletic boys, right? So there's lots of different um, differentiations that we come up with. Now, <clears throat> it's often important to know what those discrepancies are because that can tell us where to really focus our efforts. So we want to understand that heterogeneity. Um, the other thing is that as new information comes in, we want to be able to update our, our answers. And then finally, we can figure out where the research gaps are. What do I mean by a research gap? A research gap is where there's not enough evidence. So for example, <clears throat> many years ago, it was discovered that most of the people who were being studied in cardiovascular um, uh, research were males and there weren't very many women in these studies and so people realized that most of the uh, decisions that were being made in, 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 in cardiac care um, were being applied to both men and women and yet women hadn't actually been really examined right so that's a research gap that means that we that's a population that needs to be studied <clears throat> so there's a couple different types of um, evidence that we typically synthesize. And in the past, a long time ago, and continues, but not as frequently, is called the narrative review, where somebody gets an expert and says to the expert, write a paper or write a book about all the current evidence and tell us what you think should be done. And so, you know, there's lots of self-help books out there and, and they're all like this. Um, <clears throat> And so that person basically is giving you their opinion. They might do a survey of the literature, but it's going to be their opinion of what's going on. Um, and so it's not necessarily a complete picture. And, and it could be biased because that person could have some predispositions to um, say that a certain type of intervention works and another type doesn't. The systematic review was invented to be able to do this in a more scientific manner. So we're gonna talk about how to systematically search for, evaluate, and synthesize all of the existing evidence, um, to analyze it with practice methods that are scientifically valid, and then to make recommendations for future action and research. So the quantitative analysis consists of a meta-analysis, and the meta-analysis is gonna use statistics to combine the information to provide a quantitative summary. That's what I'll be talking about tomorrow. So I'll say a little bit about it toward the end of today. Now, the problem with a lot of these systematic reviews is that they can be massive. So the ones that we do for the government typically take months and they give us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do them. You might not be able to do this. So there's a, there's a few short 
shortcuts that you can take. One is called a rapid review, which is really just an abbreviated form of a systematic review. It's less comprehensive, and it's following a scientific approach to synthesize the information. But the point is you're not going for sort of a gold standard. It's like you're doing a quick job just to see what's there. Whether, you might do it just to see whether it's worth going any further. Um, a couple of other reviews that you might try, a scoping review basically is looking at what is the literature out there. So for example, to do a good systematic review, you need to find evidence. You might not know if there's any good evidence out there. So you might just do a scoping review to see if there's enough evidence to really do a systematic review. It's kind of a planning study. And then an evidence map, which is similar to a scoping review, is, is sort of just mapping out what is there and what's not. So one of my colleagues did a, um, a systematic review with the Rhode Island Arts Council. And they were looking for ways of putting art into health. In other words, people who are sick using art to, to, to make them feel better. And they didn't really know what the evidence was that was out there. So they did an evidence map just to see what was available in this field, in the artistic field, in the health related field. And they were therefore able to, to focus on a question that they could answer. Okay, so a systematic review then is a rigorous form of evidence synthesis you're trying to synthesize all the evidence that's out there to answer carefully constructed questions. You want to involve all the stakeholders um, in the process, all the people who, for whom the intervention is going to be used, all the people who are going to, to apply the intervention, all the people who are going to use the evidence. Um, it's going to be carried out by a diverse team of experts um, using a rigorous protocol to select, appraise, and extract evidence, and to consider the subjectivity and bias in the results you find and to try to minimize that in the summary that you provide. So what are some of the questions you might ask? Well, one might be how effective is a certain intervention or how important is a certain exposure? Um, what's the risk or what's the, the, the genesis of a problem? Um, you might be trying to diagnose something. You might be trying to make a prediction. You might actually be, you might have different models and you're trying to synthesize um, effects in those models. Um, you might have a methodological question, like you know, how, how well does something, some kind of method work? Um, or it might be a very qualitative type question. You might actually just be looking at surveys that people have done. So a systematic review focuses on a specific question using explicit pre-planned and scientific methods to identify, select, appraise, and summarize similar but separate studies. Okay, so we're gonna go through those terms today in, in, in fairly um, uh, detail. And this, was, um, this was, has been a definition which has been published in a variety of different ways. Um, so the key, the key idea here at this point is it's, it's a structured protocol. There's actually a protocol behind this. It's like any kind of scientific study. <clears throat> so, this is a picture that, that was published um, just to kind of give you a sense of the scope of things. So the big circle is all the reviews that could be done, um, overviews, narrative reviews, all that kind of thing. And then the, the gray area is the systematic review um, right here. And then um, this white circle are meta-analyses. And this little black circle are a particular type of meta-analysis called individual patient or participant data meta-analysis, which means basically putting together all the databases that you have of individual information on each person. So typically in a systematic review, we'll just look at the literature and we'll get their summary numbers and we don't, we don't know what happened to each person in the study. But sometimes you might actually have old databases where you might be able to get data from other people and put that together. And that would be this small tiny dot here and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go forward. Okay, so here's the systematic review process. This is a diagram that we published in an article a few years ago. Um, so on the left-hand side here, and this sort of takes us through those modules that I'm gonna go through is, is preparing your topic. In other words, what are the key questions you're asking? Um, what are the key outcomes you're looking for? And, and, and how are you gonna set up that framework to find the information? Um, then, we, then we search for the studies. We go into databases um, like Medline in, in, in healthcare or um, uh, psych info in, in psychology. There are various databases out there of literature. Um, we identify what are the eligibility criteria for a review, like we want studies that involve humans and maybe children and maybe people who are in the United States. Um, and then we talk, we search for the relevant studies. Then once we have all those studies, 
we, we read through them very quickly. We read through the abstracts, the titles to see which ones seem relevant. Um, then we might go get the papers and look through those more carefully. And then we finally come up with a small group of papers that seem relevant to our questions. Now, if we have multiple questions, we might have more studies in, we might have 10 studies that answer one question, another eight studies that answer another question. So we might get quite a few of these studies. We then take, take the studies and we go in and extract the data. We set up an extra data extraction form and we, we pull out certain information that will enable us to assess the risk of bias and do the meta-analysis and, and, and just summarize what's out there. Then we analyze and synthesize the data using various tools and techniques, and then we report our findings. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic process. So we have a little video, which I'm not gonna try to run here because we haven't set the audio up, but if you go to our website, you can run this little video. It's, it's cute, cute five minute video just to sort of show you what's, what's happening in the process. Um, so when you're, when you're starting out, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get together all the people who are stakeholders. And this is really important. Why do we want all the stakeholders here at the beginning? Because you're usually doing a systematic review because you want to answer some kind of a question that's somewhat controversial, right? If, if the answer is obvious, you don't need to do a systematic review. So if the answer isn't obvious, there's probably some dis disagreement, right? And so you wanna make sure that in the end, once you've done your systematic review, that everybody agrees with your answer or at least understands the way you did things and isn't gonna complain that your whole study was biased. So you want to get those stakeholders together in the beginning and you want to ask them, what are the key questions? What are the meaningful questions for you? So for example, if you're doing a health study, the question that's of interest to the insurance uh, executive may be very different from the question that's in interesting to the patient. But if you want both of those stakeholders to buy in to your, um, your review, then you need to ask them what those questions are so you can look at everything that's of interest. <clears throat> you then might want, you want to think about how that answer is going to be used, right? So um, if that's going to be used to actually make you know, an, an economic decision, then you may need an economic analysis. Um, if it's only going to be used to, to, to make a coverage decision or um, maybe let's, let's talk about another field. Let's say you're, you're an ecologist and you want, you're out in the field and you're trying to figure out, okay, do I, um, <clears throat> I, I want to protect this environment. What's the best way to protect the environment? Do I, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about you know, forest management. Do I, do I cut trees down to make sure that there's no undergrowth and so there won't be forest fires? Do I not? Um, so what's the, what, how is that answer going to be used? It's going to be used to make decisions like that. Then you better, you better have the right questions to answer. Um, what people need to make those decisions. When you, then, you, then you need to assess the amount of existing research on the topic, right? So um, if there's a ton of information, then the question is going to be too broad. It's going to be too hard to answer it. If it's too narrow, you won't be able to find anything. So the first thing you should probably do is make sure nobody else has done this because otherwise it's a waste of time. There's a, there's a few databases around. There's one called Prospero, which actually you can use. I'm not sure if it, it, it goes outside the healthcare area. I think it might, but in any case, it will allow you to see whether other people have done systematic reviews in that area. You can also, of course, search the literature to, to find out what's been done. Um, and then we're going to use um, the PICO criteria to formulate our questions. And I'll talk about this uh, going forward, but the basic idea here is you, you decide what's the population you're studying, what's the intervention, and what's the comparator of the things that you're, you're interested in, in doing the research on? And then what are the outcomes you're looking at? And then what are, what's the study design? What's the setting? What's the timing? And so forth. And so we'll talk about this in a little more detail as we go through today. Um, the next step is to search for the studies. So you want to find a comprehensive collection of studies related to the question of interest. You want to define what are the inclusion exclusion criteria. So unlike a, a single study, we're not talking here about which, what individuals to include in the study. Like we're, if, you do a, if you do a randomized trial, you might say, I'm going to look at, I'm going to use individuals who are, who are 40 to 65 years old and who have a certain type of, um, who live in a certain area and so forth. Here we're talking about what types of studies do we want, right? So do we want randomized control trials or do we want observational studies or do we want studies that, um, that, that examined um, a certain type of population or that used a certain kind of intervention. Um, 
do we want to look at studies that were, were only um, gave statistical results or studies that were just surveys? Once we've done that, we, we find all those studies and we remove the ones that are not relevant. Um, and it's important to note that the studies that you find that are in the literature may not reflect the entire body of research. So this is an important area, which is oftentimes called publication bias. What publication bias means is that some studies were done, but they were never published. And this could lead to, to, to bias in the results. So for example, let's say you did a study and you spent a lot of time on it. And at the end, it didn't work out the way you'd hoped. You didn't get the answer you were hoping for. The thing that you were, you were testing didn't work. And so you decided not to publish it. Somebody else does the same experiment. It, the experiment works and they publish it. Now you go look in the literature, what do you find? You found the study that worked. You don't find the study that didn't work because it wasn't published. That's now a bias because actually there were two studies done and it worked in one and it didn't work in the other, but all you found is the one it worked in. There's another kind of bias called reporting bias. This is when the study is actually published, but they don't give you all the information that was collected. Again, let's say you looked at three different outcomes and one of them was significant and the other two were not. So you published the one that was significant and you left out the other two. Now there's again, there's gonna be a, a bias, right? Because when you go to do the systematic review, you're only gonna find the outcome that was significant, not the two that weren't, right? So these are, these are important problems. And we're gonna talk about ways that you can, you can get around that. Um, it's kind of hard with the publication bias. With the reporting bias, it's a little bit easier if you can find the protocols of the original studies. Um, and there are some databases now uh, that are coming online that, that do this. Um, <clears throat> then you, you can look at the protocol and say, well, what data did they collect? Um, and uh, there's also sometimes you can read between the lines in these studies. And they might say, for example, we looked at 10 outcomes and we're only reporting three. Um, and so there are some, there are some um, techniques out there for trying to adjust for that. Okay, now you've got your studies. You want to take out the data that's, that's um, important and you wanna look for inconsistency. So we're gonna talk about some, have some sort of funny examples here of papers where uh, the same piece of information uh, appears like three times in the paper in three different ways, or things which don't add up. Like they say that they had 50 people in the study and 20 were men and 23 were women. Um, those kinds of things that you'll, you'll come across and then you have to figure out what to do about that. Okay, then we get to the point of analyzing the data. So we wanna carefully evaluate our findings and draw, draw our conclusions. So there's a question, yes. So we, we generally want to look at unpublished studies if we can, it's called the gray literature. I'll say something about that. The problem with the unpublished literature is it's often not as rigorous as, I'll give you an example, let's say, Somebody's published an abstract because they gave a talk at a conference. So the abstract is only going to give you minimal information and it oftentimes is preliminary data. Um, so it may actually not be the final answer and it may actually have a lot of reporting bias in it, right? Because they're only giving you the couple outcomes that they want to talk about in their, in their, in their discussion. Um, so that's, you know, those, those kinds of issues you have to deal with. Um, so, you know, the first thing you want to do when you synthesize the data is you don't want to do any kind of fancy statistical analysis. You just want to summarize what's out there. You know, what is the quality? What, well, first of all, what are the studies you found? What are their characteristics? How good are they? Um, what, what have they studied? What haven't they studied? What interventions did they look at? What exposures did they look at? What, what settings did they, did they um, examine? Um, you want to talk a little bit about whether there's agreement in the studies or disagreement. And you want to talk about how you can reconcile those disagreements. Um, is there some sort of way that you can statistically summarize it? Or maybe you just want to, to, to qualitatively summarize it. And then finally, you may find some studies that are just too poor that you really just want to exclude from your review. Uh, not completely. You want to mention that you found them, but you might want to say, you know, these really just were poorly done studies or they were incompletely reported. And I just don't feel comfortable putting those in with the others. So again, the, 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 the um, key idea here is transparency. You really want to just let the reader know what you found and try to, to make, let them make their own decisions. And then finally, the final step is to report, um, to write a clear narrative of 
not only what you found, but how you found it. Like what were the steps that you went through? What databases did you search? Uh, what were the questions that you were asking? Uh, what were the pieces of information you extracted? What was the quality of the data? Um, what, what statistical findings did you, did you find if you did some statistical analysis? Um, and different kinds of reports will differ in varying levels of detail. So for example, if you're a company that's making a product, you may have a long, long, long report that you have to submit to a government agency. For example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to get approval for a drug, the FDA requires lots and lots of paper. Um, but when you actually publish that paper in, in a medical journal, you know, it may be six or seven pages. It may be a very short summary of what's there. So what we oftentimes try to want to try to find are those, those very detailed reports because those will have a lot of information oftentimes that we, we can't find, but we may not be able to find those. So just keep that in mind um, that, that what you're going to find in different studies may be quite, uh, quite variable. Yes. Yeah, so a literature search basically just means I'm going to look through the literature and I'm going to find the papers. It may or may not require any kind of analysis. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different terms that are used. I'm, I'm using systematic review and meta-analysis, but you'll hear uh, synthesis, overview, uh, you know, a lot of terms like that. So um, sometimes they mean the same thing and sometimes they, they may be components of it. Um, so here's a couple of just examples, a couple from our work first. Um, we were able to look at what was the effect of omega-3 fatty acids on cardiovascular health. And so the question that was posed was, should you take omega-3 fatty acids to prevent strokes, heart attacks, or other cardiovascular diseases? And um, what we found when we looked online is you can find a lot of claims about omega-3 fatty acids. I mean, there's pills out there that you can buy in a grocery store. Um, there's all kinds of, there's actually different types of omega-3 fatty acids. People are, some people are claiming that this, um, you know, take this pill and you'll never get a heart attack. <clears throat> so what did we do? We searched for existing research. Um, we excluded irrelevant studies and we used statistical methods to combine the results. And um, we found that omega-3 fatty acids improved some intermediate outcomes, meaning not outcomes like did more people live or die, but intermediate outcomes like blood pressure, cholesterol, those kinds of things. That, so in particular, we found lower triglycerides and, 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 and LDL cholesterol were reduced and were improved with uh, use of omega fatty acids. But we failed to show that they actually contributed to a reduction in heart attacks and strokes. So in this case, the, the evidence is somewhat inconclusive because while it's improving biomarkers that are known to affect cardiovascular health, it's not actually affecting sort of the bottom line outcome, right? So um, if you were a teacher and you wanted to know if a certain um, uh, technique was working in your classroom, um, you, you might find that uh, students uh, did more homework um, by using this certain technique where they paid more attention in class, but then maybe they didn't do as well. They didn't do any better on their, their tests, right? So that, so the bottom line outcome is not met, but sort of the intermediate outcome is met. So that's sort of an interesting question all of its own is, is are the intermediate outcomes just not right uh, to look at? Or maybe there's some other kind of factor that also needs to be operating. For example, in the classroom, maybe you not only need this technique, but you need to give the students more time on the test or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, you might ask, well, why have I seen headlines about omega-3 fatty acids preventing heart attacks? And why did my doctor tell me to take fish oil pills to protect my health? And so the headlines are often based on one study, right? As I said, one study could come out and be very positive and the next study could be very negative. And maybe your doctor's only read the positive study. Um, so the, thing, the nice thing about the systematic review is because you're getting all the studies out there, you can see if there's a trend, whether there's just one study that happened to be positive and we often find this that the first study is positive and then succeeding studies are negative, right? Because somebody found a, uh, got lucky somehow in their, in, in their research and they found something wasn't real. So these kinds of mistakes can happen. Um, the challenge is that you can only analyze the studies that exist, right? So there may not be enough studies on it. Um, we can't conclusively say here that these, um, these markers have, have no effect um, because the, the evidence is not strong enough for that. 
So we can't conclude there's no effect. We also conclude there, we can't conclude there is an effect. We can only say there's little evidence that they prevent heart attack and strokes based on the available data that we have. But again, it relates to how many studies we have and how, how much we believe them. Okay, second example, um, we worked with the CDC on this one. So they were interested in whether um, maternal obesity had an effect on pregnancy outcomes. And one of the ones we looked at was, was cesarean section. And um, the question was, we know pregnant women who are obese or overweight have a higher likelihood of needing a cesarean section, but what's our best estimate of how likely that is? And how does that likelihood change among women who are of different levels of obesity? And so we searched for public, published research about obesity and pregnancy. We selected studies that included data that had the mother's weight, they included a comparison group, and presented data to calculate the mother's level of obesity and their likelihood of cesarean delivery. We extracted data from the selected studies, and we combined the data to calculate an overall estimated likelihood of the cesarean delivery for overweight women compared to women in the normal weight range. And so what we found, this was published um, a few years ago, and I should have put the citation here, but I didn't. Um, but if you wanna ask me, I'm happy to, to, to give it to you. Um, we found that if the mother was overweight, which is a BMI between 25 and 30, um, she was one point, about one and a half times more likely to need a C-section. If she was obese, which is, I believe, between 30 and 35 on the BMI, it's two times more likely, and severely obese, 35 or more on the BMI, is almost three times more likely. So we found the dose-response relationship. So the likelihood of cesarean delivery is definitely higher among the obese women. And each 1% decrease in the number of women who are um, giving birth who are obese would lead to 16,000 fewer C-sections a year, according to these data, right? So if we could, if we could reduce overweight, um, number of overweight women, we could reduce the number of, of cesarean sections according to the information we have. All right, so is this a good study or not? Um, it's got a dose response relationship. It's kind of in the direction of what we expect. So this is probably something which we might believe. If we'd found the, the, the numbers to be going in the opposite direction, like the highest weight for the overweight and the lowest weight for the severely overweight, it wouldn't make much difference because of course, the reference group here is normal women for whom the risk is one. And so um, we would expect the highest effects to be in the more overweight women. Question. Yeah, so there, those are all the interesting types of questions that you kind of have to read into the study, in the indiv individual studies, right? So those are the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, so yeah, I don't recall exactly what we had, but you know, there were certain definitions in these studies about um, you know, how these, how, how those things were defined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a, that's a good point, and and that's oftentimes the problem with a lot of these reviews is that you will find that the inclusion exclusion criteria do vary from study to study. And so then the question is, we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, when can you combine things and when shouldn't you combine them? <clears throat> um, a third example, which I just threw in here so that we get off, off health for a second. Um, so I, I contributed to a book on in ecology meta-analysis methods in ecology a few years ago. And one of the examples we had there <clears throat> was an association between um, uh, mating history in, in butterflies, Lepidoptera. <clears throat> so the, the idea here was that um, the, the female lays eggs and gives birth to, um, I know they don't give birth to butterflies, whatever they give birth to, I should remember this, eggs, but, but then, but then the, they develop into larvae, right? So yeah, <clears throat> so the idea here is, um, which, which I'd never heard of before, but it was interesting was, uh, they were interested in seeing whether males who are virgins um, had better or worse sort of reproductive success with females than males who are not virgins. virgins. Um, and so, um, actually I, should, don't, I don't have the answer there. Um, it turned out the, um, the virgin males were actually um, better. Uh, they, they, the, the females produced more eggs if they mated with the virgin male and they, they more, more of them survived as well. Um, <clears throat> 
So you can you can apply this in, in, in a lot of different areas. And again, the, re, the, the research that you find is, is going to be, um, you know, different qualities. Um, and so it's really important to have a lot of different people working on your team. Now, how long do these things take? Well, it sort of depends on, on, on how much you want to invest in it, um, how much evidence there is. Obviously, if there's a lot of evidence out there and you've got to go through thousands and thousands of articles. It's going to take a lot longer. Um, how many questions you want to ask, how skilled your, your team is, right? If you've got an experienced team, they can probably knock these off pretty quickly. If you've got a new team that you've got to teach them how to do this, it's going to take you longer. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, there have been some studies out there. So in, in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, there was a study in, in the healthcare literature. Um, they found between when the study was actually, the systematic review is actually registered to when it was published, the median time was over a year. Um, <clears throat> typical systematic reviews for agency for healthcare research and quality that we work with take um, up to a year. Um, you can do them in days, really though if you've got a simple question and a narrow question, a simple answer, or if you're just gonna, if you're not really concerned with finding every single piece of evidence. Um, so if somebody's paying you, you typically will, you know, as in most things, you do as much work as you get paid for. So if somebody's gonna pay you several hundred thousand dollars to do a study, you'll, you'll do it a lot more carefully than if somebody's paying you nothing, which a lot of us sort of do, right? Because, you know, at least in the academic world, a lot of, um, a lot of students will do these kinds of reviews for their theses. And so if they're not getting paid for it, you can't expect um, the gold standard $100,000 review. So if you really want to do this well, you need some sort of a lead who's, who's experienced in this area as a methodologist, kind of knows how these things operate. You need some sort of a quantitative expert, particularly if you're going to do statistics. Um, could be an epidemiologist, could be a statistician in the healthcare area, or, or a psychologist, or Sort of, sort of quantitative researcher. Um, you need, it's always good to have a librarian, somebody who knows how to do these searches, because typically if you're searching databases, you need these long search strings to make sure you've got all the keywords. You want to have somebody in the, in the subject matter area who's an expert who can tell you whether the questions you're as, asking make any sense and whether the answers you come up with do. Uh, you, you obviously need some research assistants to do um, all the copying and all the, all the uh, extraction and that sort of thing your stakeholders who, who you're going to uh, respond to, um, and then various people for, for producing good reports, you know, people who are good at making reports and making good, good pictures and visualizations, and then the people who are going to help you disseminate your work, because that's oftentimes the most important thing. You've done this review, you've put all this work in, and then it just sits, you don't want it to just sit on a shelf somewhere. So it can cost a lot of money. As I said, it can cost up to hundreds of thousands of dollars or it can cost nothing, depending on how much you want to invest in it. So what are some of the limitations? I mean, this is a great idea, but obviously you, know, you might say, well, I really don't have the resources for this. So it's obviously time and resource intensive. Um, another thing is that if this thing takes a long time, by the time it comes out, it could be out of date, right? Especially if you've got a fast moving field. Um, and sometimes the reviews are done in a very reductionist manner in which, you know, it's a very narrowly focused question with very narrowly focused um, criteria. And then it doesn't, it's not really broadly applicable. Um, on the other hand, if it's too broad, it may, may be too hard to do. Um, we've talked about the publication reporting bias, which is obviously uh, an issue with things when you're pulling it out of published literature. Um, and there's a limited capacity sometimes to reflect, well, what in our field is called patient-centeredness, but basically the idea that um, a lot of times the experts are interested in, in outcomes that they understand and that they can quantify, but those aren't the things that the actual users or the people to whom this is gonna be applied are interested in. So in the healthcare setting, what the patient might be interested in is not, um, not does, my, does some, uh, biomarker work, but can I actually walk up the stairs without, you know, panting? Um, or can I, uh, if, if you're an athlete, can I, can I run? Can I run five miles or something like that? Not, not just, you know, as my, let, let's say somebody breaks their leg. So the, 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 the orthopedist may be interested in, did, does the bone heal properly? The, the, the person's interested in, can I do the activities that I used to be able to do? Um, and so you got to make, that's what, that's what the importance of the stakeholder is to make sure that the, the, the questions that are, that are asked are the appropriate ones. 
Okay, so that's the end of what I have for the introduction. Um, let me stop here. I answered a couple of questions, but are there any, any questions at this point? Yes. So, yeah. Right. So if you remember that little picture of the eye, right, the, the eye, the eye there, the little black circle, um, was, the, was the individual data. And I said that those were kind of rare to find. Now, I have actually done um, studies like this. So there was one study we did, we were interested in a certain question, and we went to the literature and we found 14 studies, and we sent out requests to the 14 teams for their databases. And unbelievably, we got 11 databases. Now, we actually asked in a certain format, some of them just sent us their old SAS files or their data dumps. Um, and we were able, after, with a lot of effort, to synthesize and harmonize everything. And so we analyzed the individual data. And that was actually a gold mine. We came up with several very heavily cited publications um, out of the database. Um, and we were able to answer a lot of questions that we couldn't have otherwise. And so I'll talk about that later, about what you can answer with that type of question. But that's unusual. Um, <clears throat> what's more usual is that you might have a few studies with the databases and many studies without the databases. And then it, you, can, you can synthesize those as well, but that's just a little more complicated. Yes? Is it good practice to contact the, uh, the study people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you don't have their databases, a lot of times there'll be questions in their articles. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the, 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 the flow diagram, but um, in, in, a, in an article, you oftentimes have a flow diagram that sort of shows how the participants went through the study. And you'll oftentimes things won't quite add up. For example, they might say we randomized 100 individuals. And then when you look at the data analysis, the, the sample sizes are 96 or 97 which probably means there were three or four people without data that were analyzable and so they just dropped them, but they may not actually say that. And so you might, or there might be some other kinds of missing data and you might want to try to fill that in. So you, or there might be questions that you, you can't understand how they did some analysis. And so it's a good idea to contact them if you can. Yeah. Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent, Point. So especially if you're going to share databases, usually it's a good idea to come up with a plan in the very beginning about how you're going to handle authorship. And so in the, in the studies we did, oftentimes the principal investigator became an author on the main paper, and then we would acknowledge other people in the paper. Um, when you just do a review of the literature, it's usually not common to include the authors unless they've actually participated, because all you're basically doing is using their, their published study. Um, but that's a good thing to get to get settled right up front. Um, I actually had a really bad experience like that once, not in meta-analysis, but in another area where we had been, I was working with a colleague and we were reanalyzing someone's data. And we had gotten permission from one of the authors, but not from, I guess, and, and we'd actually worked with the, 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 the main author um, and had published something in, a, in an edited journal. And then when we went to do our reanalysis, um, they got really upset. And I think because we hadn't offered her authorship, but um, we had never, we had kind of been using her data for a long time and it was just a big misunderstanding. So it's a good thing to, to get that out of the way early on. Okay. All right. What, what time do we want to take a break, Tammy, at, just so that I know? In an hour? Okay, about 10.30? Okay. So let's move on then to module two. So again, I'm just going to show you these at the beginning of each section to let you know where we are. So we're in the beginning now. <clears throat> you now know a little bit about evidence synthesis. Now you want to actually start with a particular question. And you want to figure out how to set up that question and that uh, protocol so that it's going to give you the answer that's going to be the most useful to your stakeholders. All right, so we're going to talk here about laying the groundwork, putting together your team, and how to set up your framework so that you can do the appropriate analysis um, for your question. <clears throat> okay, so before you start collecting information, it's important to understand what you're trying to do. So this is, you know, this is good advice in general. Um, think through your topic, look at the available evidence. You don't have to do this systematically, but sort of scan it, uh, 
you may want to use your experts to do this. So your experts probably have some idea about what's in the literature. And so ask them a question like, you know, does this seem like a topic that's useful to pursue? And do you think there's some evidence out there? And then try to try to figure out who should, who you need on your team. What's your systematic review about? Why are you doing the research? How do you hope to use the results? Who will care about your results when you're finished? Right? You might have a, a question that's really, really interesting to you, but nobody else really cares about it. Um, it's sort of an, what we call an academic question, right? It's, it's, it's interesting to you as an academic, but it's not really going to be very practical because maybe what you're developing just has no use whatsoever. Um, so that's not terribly useful to pursue further. So then you want to think about what's the kind of question you're asking. And so, you know, is it, is it the effectiveness of a certain type of intervention? Or is it the risk or etiology associated with, with a certain condition? Or is it how, how common is something? What's the prevalence or the incidence of something? Like, you know, maybe you're interested in um, how often do we, have, um, do we have a flood, right? And so um, you're interested in some sort of prevalence question. Um, and you want to survey the literature to see where, you know, what's been reported about, about flooding. Um, or is it some sort of a diagnostic question? Like how accurate is a, is a mammogram? Um, or is it some sort of a prediction question? Like how accurately can we predict something? So you want to get all the predictions that have been made about something. Uh, for example, uh, you know, you're a big football fan. And you want to know how accurately does Las Vegas predict the Super Bowl, right? So you go and get all the data on all the Super Bowl predictions over the last 50 years and you, you synthesize them somehow. And believe me, there are a lot of people interested in statistics and sports. So um, there's a lot, of, a lot of data out there on that. Or other questions that, that might be of interest. Then you wanna see, well, does a systematic review already exist? So, you know, find related studies or systematic reviews. Um, sometimes you might find there's no studies at all. You can't do anything. Sometimes you might study, this has actually been looked at in a lot of different ways and, <clears throat> Some of, the, some of the systematic reviews may have been very closely related to what you want to do, but not exactly the same thing, but you might be able to use them um, and verify that there's no other similar review underway by looking at one of these databases. Because sometimes other people are studying the same question you are and you don't want to be scooped. <clears throat> so there's a repository of systematic review protocols in, in this database Prospero that I was telling you about. Um, the Cochrane and Campbell collaborations are large databases of systematic reviews that are useful to look at. So the Cochrane collaboration is an international database of systematic reviews in healthcare, and the Campbell collaboration is a, is a systematic reviews in, in social uh, research. There's also online databases like Google Scholar, PubMed, systematic review filters, and so forth. Um, if, you're, if you're in education, there's a nice database called the, called the What Works Clearinghouse which is also useful to search. Okay, now you, you, you go out there and you see what's around. This might be sort of a scoping review or type of evidence map. Are there thousands of studies about your question? Well, you might need to narrow your question a little bit. Or is there not enough research about your question, in which case your question might be too specific? Um, instead of asking, you know, do, do um, 27 year old men who weigh 275 pounds get diabetes. You might want to broaden that question a little bit to, you know, to, to, to young men have diabetes. Um, the topic may not be ready yet for systematic review. You might be interested in something that's fairly new and there really haven't been enough research published on that yet. Um, or the results that you find might have limited value, right? They're, the studies are poor. Um, the questions that you're interested in haven't been asked. The outcomes you're interested in are not available. Okay, so now let's say you've decided there is something out there to pursue. Now you want to assemble your team. So we've talked about the different groups of, of people you need. You need a multi, multidisciplinary team. Um, you need people who know the methods of systematic review. You need scientific experts. You need your quantitative experts. You need your librarians, your information specialists. You need research assistance. You need your stakeholders. Um, like for me to give this talk, I needed the, the tech experts to, to figure out how to get the computer working. So all those kinds of things. And, and a lot of times with these, with these, I'm going to tell you about some tools that we've developed online. You, you oftentimes need some fairly advanced technology to do this stuff. Um, you need a place to store all this information because we don't want to do them in file cabinets anymore. 
All right, who are the stakeholders? We've talked about this a little bit. These are individuals or groups of individuals who are responsible for or affected by the results of your review. So these would be scientists who might use your results in the field, policymakers, let's say in the government, um, patients or, or, or consumers or uh, the public, um, guideline developers, people who are developing rules for how to do things. Uh, you know, how do I lay a sewer uh, or, or, or where should I have the runoff of the sewage? There's guidelines out there that, that are made uh, based on these studies. Um, people who are going to fund research are interested in this. Um, people who are going to pay uh, for it or insure it. Um, and the researchers themselves are obviously interested because they want to know kind of whether their research is working and what, what's new, what, what needs to be done. Um, if, a, if a systematic review comes out and says, you know, there have been no studies in children, then all of a sudden there's a, there's a nice research opportunity for somebody who wants to, to, wants to do that. So the stakeholders are going to help you formulate the questions that are important. They're going to provide context for you in terms of, you know, what actually can you study and what can't you study, what's important in the field, uh, what are the questions of interest, um, what are some of the issues in the background that you might need to be aware of, um, how applicable is this to, to what's going on in the world, and, 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 and how might it be helpful to, to the public. Um, <clears throat> How transparent you should be. In other words, um, you want to actually let your readers know what you've done and be, be very aware of um, what the key questions are, what the methods are you've looked at, and what your answer is so that somebody doesn't think you've hidden things. Um, and they'll, they'll hopefully provide a lots of advice to you, feedback on, on, on all the different products that you're going to come up with, like your um, your data extraction form, your, your analyses, your reports, and then buy-in, which is important because um, if they don't buy into it, the, you know, the people who are reading it who are going to use it aren't probably going to buy into it either. And most of us would like if we do a report to be, to be quoted widely. Um, we might not get on CNN, but we'd like to actually think that our research is making a difference. Another key point is conflict of interest. So, you know, you've probably all heard about conflicts of interest. Um, uh, we, of course, have no conflicts of interest in anybody in our government these days, but, but the rest of us have lots of conflicts of interest. So there's financial conflicts of interest, right? People who are doing the research um, oftentimes are connected to a product that they're trying to sell. So if you read um, a study which is um, funded by a company and the, the members of that company are the authors of the study, you might believe that that there's some sort of conflict of interest there because they have a financial uh, stake in it. But there's also intellectual conflicts of interest. Um, you know, for example, a lot of people who work in, um, in healthcare believe that for-profit healthcare is bad. And so if there's a study of for-profit healthcare versus not-for-profit healthcare, there might be a bias there if the person studying is coming from the not-for-profit side. Or, or if, if you're um, doing an environmental question, you want to see, um, you know, what's the effect of, um, oh, I don't know, about recycling. Does recycling work? Um, you know, if you're an environmentalist, you're going to have certain biases. If you're, if you're a, a, a manufacturer, you might have other kinds of biases. And so um, those might subtly creep into your interpretation of the results. So we like to have co potential conflicts of interest disclosed up front. And we'd like to make sure that if we have, you don't necessarily want to keep people with conflicts of interest off your team because then you might be missing important points of view, but you want to make sure that you've, you've, you've balanced them off, right? <clears throat> so then you're going to think about sort of a, a, a framework for formulating your question. And so um, an analytic framework is a type of model. It's going to sort of think of like a, like a path diagram that, that links the concepts involved in the systematic review. So for example, we might be interested in studying a certain population, giving them an intervention, and then seeing what the final outcome is. And so here, um, we're, we're using this to think of how the world works. Um, so what are the research questions that we can address with the systematic review? And how can the end users understand the research if the, if the logic chain gets complex? Because there may be many interventions, there may be many sort of confounding factors that, that are going to affect the population, affect the intervention, affect the final outcome. 
And so when you have complex bodies of literature with multiple key questions, um, or a complex chain of logic between intermediate and, and, and final outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so this unfortunately didn't display too well, but the idea here is that you, um, the framework will show you um, that the systematic review here works with two different types of research. One is that the intervention is acting directly on the final outcome. And the second is that the intervention is acting through the intermediate outcome to the final outcome. And so for some of you may be uh, familiar with things like mediation analysis. This is a type of path or mediation analysis where you're looking at um, is the effect of the intervention mainly directly on the final outcome or is it mainly through an intermediate outcome? Um, so for example, if I give you a pill to reduce your blood pressure, I'm hoping that it will reduce your risk of having a stroke. So the pill may only reduce your risk of stroke through the blood pressure or it might also re reduce your risk of stroke because it also reduces your cholesterol, or it might have a more, it might have an effect through some other means, right? And so I'm sort of interested in the end, um, in 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 what's the what's the direct and the indirect effect. So I might be able to sort of disentangle that if I have a proper path here. And so this is a picture of um, the idea of you have an exposure. Um, there's some markers that that exposure acts on. Uh, there are some um, surrogate outcomes that are valid surrogates for the clinical outcome. And then there's some intermediate markers, which are possible predictors of the clinical outcome, but they're, they're not necessarily, have not necessarily been shown to be related to the final outcome. And so you can have all these different paths that, through which things could be operating. Now, the nice thing is if you have a randomized controlled trial, a lot of this stuff is kind of controlled for, right? Because you've, you've done a randomization, so you've balanced a lot of these things out. But a lot of, a lot of our systematic reviews may be with non-randomized data, exposure data, um, or, or things that we can't, we can't actually randomize individuals to. We just compare like one class with another class. And um, so some of these confounding factors may work themselves in. So it's a good idea to have this framework in mind. You may, not, may or may not be able to figure out what all these paths are, but at least in your final uh, interpretation, you can sort of judge what might be some of the factors that, that might um, restrict the generalizability of your conclusions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So in other words, you might have some studies which are just looking at the markers, right? Um, and that's very common if the markers happen quickly, but the final outcomes take a long time, right? So for example, let's say you're looking at how well does Head Start work as an educational tool for three-year-olds, right? So your, 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 your quick marker might be, well, uh, do, you know, do the children learn to play with blocks or something together? Well, right. Or can they, can they read maybe by the end of they're you know, going into kindergarten, or can they, can they make out words? Do they know their alphabet? The final marker is like, well, how well did they go to college or did they, you know, did they get a good job or something like that? That's something way down the road. So uh, obviously that's gonna require long-term follow-up. And so those study, kinds of studies will be very different. Yeah, well, so in this case, an intermediate marker, like in that example, it would be, does the child, can the child read going into kindergarten? The final outcome is, does the child, um, you know, graduate from high school or graduate from college, right? Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, the indicator, so these are just kind of, um, the indicator marker is more something that's, um, it's not necessarily an outcome. I mean, you could think of it like an outcome. It's sort of just degrees of separation. So uh, it might be, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of, of an example where you'd have a, a, a marker that's not an outcome. I mean, um, I mean, in this, in this example, the surrogate outcome is a predictor of a clinical outcome. So it's something that's actually thought to affect the final clinical outcome. So for example, your blood pressure is thought to affect your risk of a heart attack or of a stroke. So that would be a, a surrogate outcome. Um, 
you know, the indicator marker might be some um, chemical that's in your bloodstream or something that you're, you're, you're testing. All right, so here, for example, um, you know, here's an example of an analytic framework for looking at treatments, both psychological and pharmacological treatments for adults with PTSD, right? So, um, you know, you, you start off with a diagnosis of PTSD, um, and then there's certain patient characteristics or types of trauma that, that are related, um, and there's certain types of interventions that you're looking at, and then you're interested in a variety of different outcomes here related to um, reducing symptoms, remission of the PTSD, uh, prevention of comorbid conditions, what's the person's quality of life, what's their functional impairment, how quickly can they return to work. Um, and then there's adverse events of the intervention. So for example, if you take the pill and you, um, it makes your stomach upset or it gives you bad dreams or um, you're doing um, a psychological intervention that makes somebody anxious or whatever, violent, um, these are all kinds of adverse effects as well. And so these all might also be types of outcomes you're interested in, what we call the harms and the benefits. Here's, a, here's one for treating adults with bipolar disorder. Um, so again, we have adults with bipolar disorder. There's certain characteristics which lead to that disorder. There are the, then certain types of treatments. And so the first question is looking at how well do the treatments affect the final outcomes, uh, like reduction in episodes, reduction in self-harm, improved function, et cetera. The second question was related to the adverse events of the interventions. Um, the third question is related to the intermediate outcomes, like how quickly do they respond to the treatment? Um, do they have good adherence to the treatment? Um, do they reduce um, side effects and, and so forth? And then the final question, uh, key question four said, basically what types of characteristics are related to people with bipolar disorder, right? So why would you be interested in that question? Well, that question goes to the generalizability of what types of individuals might you need to, to, to intervene on here. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. Exactly. So that's a great point. So as the process goes along, you're going to be refining the question, right? So, um, you know, you might do a quick search of the literature and you say, okay, I can answer these questions. Um, a lot of the reviews that I have either participated in or reviewed for AHRQ, for example, they might have five key questions. And in the end, maybe one of the questions there's no data on. And so their, their final conclusion is there's no data to answer this question. That's actually an important conclusion because that, that's a gap in the research, right? Um, so, uh, but, but it might be that you discover that, you know, there's outcomes you've missed um, and you need to add them, or maybe there's some intermediate outcomes you've forgotten about, or, or maybe there's, a, there's, a, there's stuff in the literature that you didn't realize was available and so you want to synthesize that as well. Yeah. So you can, you can keep refining this. Uh, it's, it's why it's good to have a protocol, and obviously you want to keep revising the protocol as you go along and just documenting that. Any other? Yes. Yeah. The outcomes are, the interventions are, um, the kinds of populations that are looked at. These are all part of sort of the PICO criteria that I'll be talking about. Yeah. But the outcomes are obviously very important. Okay, um, so let me go on now to the question. All right, so now we kind of have some idea about, we've got a team together, we've got some idea to go forward. Now what's the question that we should ask? And so what I wanna, what I wanna work on here is how do you formulate a good research question that you can actually answer? Okay, so we're still on the preparing topic and now we're gonna refine the key questions and so we want to talk here about what are some of the general considerations that you need to think about when you're when you're formulating a question what are some of the types of questions you want to ask um, what's the framework for developing those questions and what are some of the different study designs that you could use so here's some examples of questions is completing root canal treatment i don't know how many people have had a root canal i've been lucky enough to avoid them but i hear they're awful um, 
in a single visit as effective and safe as completing the treatment over multiple visits. Does starting high school at 8.30 lead to better student academic performance than starting at 7.30? So there's some evidence out there that teenagers in particular um, have different uh, circadian rhythms and they don't work too well early in the morning. Um, and so therefore starting school, they're half asleep. Or what's the effect of field competition on the biomass of different, uh, of different um, I think I meant here, I, I left the word out. What did I mean? Um, Creatures, I don't know, in, in a wide variety of habit, habitats. So, you know, in, in an in ecological setting, um, you're looking at different types of, let's say, um, grasses or, or, or plants. And so as you, as you introduce animals into that area, that's going to change, um, you know, what they eat and so forth. And so what's the competition? How does that relate to, to how much of the, um, you know, uh, we know that, for example, in, in Yellowstone, before they reintroduced wolves, you know, there were a lot of elk there and they were eating lots of the um, certain types of vegetation, which therefore got scarce and that affected other things. So these are sort of questions you might be interested in. Okay, so what are you considering here in the question, in, in your formulating question? Okay, first of all, who's your audience? Right, so to some extent, these are part of your stakeholders, but is your audience the general public? Is your audience the Congress? Is your audience uh, a state agency? Is your audience your, 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 your peers, your research peers? Um, what's your purpose in doing this? Are you trying to develop guidelines? Are you trying to change policy? Are you just trying to do, it, do an academic study? Um, uh, what, what, what are you actually doing this for? Um, is your question going to be narrow or broad? Are you trying to solve a very, very specific question or are you trying to have a very broad question? Um, you know, going back to this question about the, the high school, for example, um, so that's a pretty specific question, 7.30 versus 8.30. You might broaden that to say, well, what is an early start versus a late start? What evidence is available, right? So again, this is something you want to look at um, you won't want the question to have to be too broad or too narrow. Are your chosen outcomes scientifically meaningful and useful? So a lot of times we have outcomes we'd like to measure, but there really is no good way of measuring them. Or the tool that's being used is, is inadequate. Um, we talk about validated scales. That means that somebody's actually gone through and done a scientific experiment to test whether that scale actually measures what it's supposed to, to measure. Obviously, if it's a if it's, if it's some sort of a, um, a physical measurement, we're gonna have a lot more um, validity than if it's a subjective measurement, uh, like a scale. <clears throat> what are the available resources you have? So if you have a lot of time and money, you can answer a lot more than if you don't. All right, so what are your eligibility criteria? What kind of studies are you gonna allow into your systematic review? Um, how are you gonna develop your research strategy and how are you gonna abstract your data, right? So again, this, goes, this all goes to resources. All right, do you have a broad or a narrow question? So the you, let's say you're interested in what's the efficacy of aspirin in preventing strokes in women? Or what's the effectiveness of a specific reading program among middle school children? So if the question is very broad, if it's like, well, how well does reading work for kids? That's a pretty broad question. And so, First of all, the studies that you collect may be very different from each other. Some might be addressing reading in uh, first grade and others are addressing reading in sixth grade. And so if you combine those, they may not really be very comparable. Uh, they may not really answer one particular question. And that's what we call the apples and oranges problem. In other words, we're combining apples and oranges, things that are very different. The searches might also take a lot longer because you're gonna get a lot more literature. You've got a very broad question. It's gonna be hard to synthesize and interpret it because you're gonna have all these different factors. And so your analytic framework is very, very complicated. You've got lots of outcomes. You've got lots of different types of interventions, lots of different populations you're studying. And so in the end, it's just gonna be really hard to make any sense of it all. Um, you might find an unmanageable number of studies. You might find a thousand studies and there's just no way in the world you're gonna be able to extract data from a thousand studies. Um, so what you might wanna do is you might wanna take your broad question and split it into subparts. That's one way of handling that. The other problem, the conversely, you might have the question be too narrow. And so now it's only applicable in a few very specialized settings, populations, exposures, 
and you might not find many studies at all or no studies, right? So that's kind of a useless, a useless survey. So here's an outline of different types of questions you might ask. So for example, what proportion of the population is newly diagnosed with a problem each year? So that's sort of an incidence question. Um, how many fish are caught every year in this, in this river? Um, how many cars drive through this tunnel you know, every day? What proportion of the population is currently living with the problem? That's more of a prevalence question. You know, how many people have registered their vehicles and have insurance on? Um, how many people actually not get diabetes every year, but have diabetes? Um, another question you might ask is what should be done to treat the problem? That's a therapy type question. So what can I do to reduce the traffic volume in this area? Uh, what can I do to make sure that people don't have a stroke? Um, next question might be, Will det detecting the problem earlier before symptoms make a difference in my health? This is a screening question. Um, should, I get, should I get tested for AIDS or should I get blood pressure screening or should I get a mammogram? These are all um, screening questions to, to try to avoid problems later on. Um, another one might be how good is this test at, di at testing this problem? This is a diagnostic accuracy question. Um, you know, if, I do, if I do this screening, how well does it identify the problem? Or if I have a condition, how well is it diagnosed? Um, another type of question is what's the likely outcome? So what's the prognosis? What's gonna happen? Um, you know, if, if there's a lot of cars on the road, like what's gonna happen? Is, 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 is there going to be, uh, are there gonna be more accidents? Are there going to be uh, more road closures? Um, is the road gonna have to be repaired more often? Um, will there be any negative effects? So looking at harms, all the side effects. Of, of the issue. What causes the problem, right? The etiology and how can the problem be prevented? So these are all different types of questions that you might or might not want to do a systematic review of. Okay, so now we have a, we have a mnemonic here called a PICO or PICO D, sometimes PICO S, um, that stands for the components of a well-formulated question. So P is for population, I is for intervention, C is for comparator, O is for outcome and D is for design. So I wanna take you through each of those uh, components. So for the population, what specific people or conditions are you researching? Are you looking at adults or kids? Are you looking at uh, men or women? Um, are you looking at people in the United States or people in Africa? Um, are you looking at people who own a car or people who don't own a car? So you wanna be very precise about this because when you're searching for the studies and sharing the results and disseminating things and reporting on it, you need to make sure what, to whom this research applies, right? So let's say you say, I wanna study children, okay? Now you come across a study which has both children and adults and it's not clear how many are children, how many are adults. Is that, is that study get included or not? Right, so you want to be really clear. I'm only going to include studies that are only children or any study that might have children in it, for example. So here's a question that is not a very good one for a systematic review. What's the best way to manage patients with kidney disease? All right, so the doctor's interested in that, right? The patients may be interested in it as well. Um, people come to you with kidney disease or you diagnose it. First of all, you have to diagnose it. Um, what's the best way to manage it? So why isn't that a very good question? Why is that not formulated terribly well? Well, first of all, what do you mean by patients? First of all, not everyone with kidney disease is a patient, right? People can have kidney disease and they don't know it, or um, they, they know it, but they're not really being treated for it. Um, or um, the patients could be people who are in a hospital or people who are being treated in a clinic. So am I talking about people who are hospitalized for kidney disease or people who just have it or are being treated for it? Um, or people who've ever got, who have ever gotten a prescription for a drug for it? So what does that mean? And um, another question might be, what's the age range that I'm looking at? Am I looking at kids or adults? So you might reformulate the question to say, what's the best way to manage uh, adult patients with kidney disease? So the next thing you wanna clarify is what you mean by kidney disease. 
So you want to define the condition. Now, um, this is one place where the healthcare literature tends to differentiate from the social science literature um, and other literatures. In that, in the healthcare literature, the questions seem to be much more narrowly focused. So um, one of the earliest meta-analyses that was done uh, by a man named Gene Glass, he was interested in what were the effects of psychotherapy. And that was the question he asked. And he found hundreds of studies. Now in, in healthcare these days, that would be considered a poorly formulated question because it's not specific enough, right? Well, what kinds of psychotherapy given to what kinds of people under what kinds of conditions? Because the, the, the idea is that if you just know that psychotherapy works, that doesn't tell you what type of psycho psychotherapy works and for whom. So you wanna use very specific language when you're defining what you're studying. Um, and so it turns out that medical experts commonly nowadays use five different, they, they consider five different stages of kidney disease. Um, and some of these stages have technical and colloquial names. So stage one kidney disease corresponds to a certain amount of filtration that your kidney does in stage two. There's, there's various definitions of this in various ways. And there's other types of things besides how well your kidney filters is certain biomarkers um, like creatinine and albumin in your blood. And so levels of these things define these stages of the disease. So if you're in an early stage, you're very different from in a late stage, right? So study the interventions that you use for one are gonna be very different from the interventions you use for another. So you wanna be specific on this. So the last stage of kidney disease is often called stage five kidney disease. It's also called end stage renal disease or kidney disease. It's called renal or kidney failure. It's typically when you need to go on dialysis or when you need a kidney transplant, right? You're in really bad shape at this point. Your kidney's doing a very bad, uh, effort of, of filtering stuff out of your, of your system. So here, um, let's say you're interested in stage five chronic kidney disease. And so um, your question now might be reformulated as what's the best way to manage adults with stage five chronic kidney disease, right? So we've now changed kidney disease to stage five chronic kidney disease, and we've changed people to adults. Um, and the next question might be, how are you identifying people with kidney disease, right? Because there's a lot of ways of identifying this and different studies may do it in different ways. So you wanna make sure that the studies have identified people consistently and in a way that you think is correct, right? So um, there's a lot of diagnoses out there, as you know, um, in whatever field you're talking about that are, that are incorrect, right? There's misdiagnosis. Somebody might not know the proper rules or they might make a bad judgment. Um, and so there may be, not be good evidence on this. So it turns out the kidney function is best measured by something called the glomerular filtration rate or GFR for short. And that's the amount of waste that's being filtered out of your kidneys. And so if you have low GFR, in other words, if your kidneys are not filtering very rapidly, you have poor kidney function. But it turns out that measuring GFR is very difficult, but you can, you can approximate it by a formula um, that colleagues of mine and I have worked on. Um, and so if you know somebody's age, sex, race, and creatinine level, you can come up with a pretty good idea and that's called estimated GFR. So a lot of studies in this area diagnose the people with an estimated GFR. They'll say we use the, the such and such formula um, using estimated GFR. And that's how they define kidney disease. So everybody, for example, whose estimated GFR is less than 20 was considered to be, have chronic kidney disease and they're in this study. And so you wanna include this level of specificity in your research plan to be transparent, but also to be reproducible because you want somebody else who's, who would be doing this review to come up with the same answer. So ideally you wanna have everybody diagnosed through a lab test, um, but that can be costly and invasive and you probably don't have the money for that. So there's a trade off here between rigor and real world practice. And obviously if you require all your studies to have a gold standard, you might not find enough studies for re your review, but if you're too vague and you sort of allow anything, then you're gonna include studies that don't capture what you're really interested in, right? So you have to be, careful about this. This is where the scientific experts are important because they can tell you what's a valid measure and what's not and, and what might work and what might not work. 
Yes. How do you know when you have enough uh, data for your computer? Well, um, I mean, when we start talking about the meta analysis, you're going to, you're going to realize you probably need five to 10 studies at least to do it, to, to do a decent review, um, and get it, get a reasonable statistical answer. Um, cause you're just taking an average of things. Um, I mean, if you're just going to do a qualitative review, then a few studies might be useful. Um, you might not be able to give a definitive answer about the magnitude of something, but you might be able to give a qualitative description of, you know, does this tend to work or not work? Um, oftentimes also you're just trying to rule things out. So if you can find some things that don't work, that might be very informative too. Like if you have three studies where something doesn't work and none where it does, then you might feel that, well, even if it does work, it probably works in such a limited uh, group of individuals that it's not really worth pursuing further. Okay, so that's the population. What are you, what are you studying um, and how specific do you want to be? The next, the next um, letter is I for intervention. And this relates to what treatments, tests, interventions, or exposures are you studying? So what are you interested in seeing the effect of? So for example, again, with stage five chronic kidney disease, you might be interested in looking for management for this, and you might be interested in, okay, well, what drugs should I be giving or what treatments in what doses for what duration, how frequently and how, how am I going to deliver them? So for example, if you're going to give dialysis, should the dialysis be um, uh, hemodialysis or peritoneal di dialysis? Uh, should I be giving it for three hours, four hours, five hours? Should I be giving it three times a week, four times a week, twice a week? <clears throat> How much the dose should be? Where should I give it? In, in a clinic or at home? C stands for comparator. <clears throat> so what are you comparing this to? And not, not all reviews are comparative either. Some, are, some might just be prevalence, in which case you don't have this consideration. Yeah, question. Mm-hmm. An exposure, okay. Yeah, so, so for example, um, let's say you're looking at the effect of um, certain pollutants. Like you wanna know um, what's the relationship between, between a certain chemical in the air and, and um, asthma, for example. So now um, you're going to be measuring a particular pollutant and you'll be measuring, um, <clears throat> you know, you, your question might be, well, is it parts per million, um, you know, at a certain time? What time of day am I doing it? You know, am I measuring it at? Um, over what area? Kind of question. Um, let's see. In a in a in a um, in an educational setting, you might be looking at um, giving. Um, you might have a reading program, and you want to know whether. Um, do I, do I do this program twice a week, three times a week, four times a week? Do I do it um, to the whole classroom together or do I break them down into groups by tracking? Um, those kinds of questions. So the comparators relate to, and again, this is if you have a comparative study, who are you comparing this treatment to? So you probably are all familiar with this idea that you need a control group to be able to really see what an intervention does because there is this thing called the placebo effect, which basically means that when people are studied, they tend to do differently than when they're not studied. And so you might give people, for example, I've often found when I come home from playing soccer and I'm really sore and I take an Advil, that within like five minutes, I feel better. Now there's no way that thing is working that fast, but just psychologically, the fact that I took the pill and I know that I'm now gonna feel better, makes me feel better, right? So that's the placebo effect. So you wanna have some sort of a control group. Now the problem with, with studies is that they oftentimes have very different types of control groups. So some may, may have a real control group, which is people who are just like those in the intervention group, but who didn't get the intervention, or didn't have the exposure. <clears throat> Sometimes it's people who um, were given a placebo. 
they were actually given something to mimic the intervention so that they thought they got an intervention, but they really didn't. Um, it could be no intervention at all. So in an exposure study, for example, people who are exposed to cigarette smoke and people who are not, the controls are people who are not. Um, or it could be something that you're currently doing and then you, you, you have an innovation and you try something new and you compare what happened when you put the new inter the innovation in versus previously before it was in. Or it could be another well-accepted intervention. For example, we, I've, I've worked with some researchers looking at the effects of Tai Chi on people who have uh, arthritis. And um, so our control in that case was, was not just doing nothing, but it was people doing an exercise program or, or, doing, a, or, or doing some sort of aerobic fitness. Um, so that the idea was that, okay, if we want to show that Tai Chi actually works compared to something that's already known to work. Right, rather than just say nothing at all. Now, one interesting thing here is that when you look at a lot of times companies, when they are trying to get a product approved, they will obviously try to set up their study so that it has the best chance of being successful. So what type of control do you think they're gonna use? They're gonna use the, a control that has the least interventions possible, right? So that they have the best chance of showing an effect. So you'll oftentimes find these studies where um, <clears throat> there's some studies where the control is actually, you know, a well-accepted intervention and other studies where the control is a placebo. And then you have to make a decision as to whether you can put those together, right? Are those combinable? Because those, those effects may be quite different. So here's some examples. <clears throat> what are you comparing? So let's say you're comparing two drugs or you're comparing medical therapy versus surgery. Um, so you can get very specific or very general here, right? I could say I'm going to compare medical therapy versus surgery, or I'm going to compare a certain type of medical therapy versus a certain type of surgery. You know, in, in kidney disease, um, you know, you might be looking at things like kidney transplants versus no transplant or kidney transplant versus dialysis. Um, <clears throat> so in our case, Let's say we, want, we had chosen to, to define our intervention as peritoneal dialysis um, versus hemodialysis, right? So these are two different ways of filtering, blood, filtering your blood, different ways of, of, of basically getting the, um, the needle into, into your body so you can start doing the filtering. <clears throat> so, Let's say we're neutral in regards to which treatment is better. We don't think either one of these is necessarily better. We're just interested in seeing if there's a difference. So we might ask the question, how does peritoneal dialysis compare with hemodialysis in adults with stage five chronic kidney disease? <clears throat> you know, a more biased way of asking the question would be, is peritoneal dialysis better than hemodialysis for adults with stage five kidney disease? All right, so you're probably also all familiar with surveys that you get in the mail or maybe online where they ask you questions like, um, you know, very, very biased questions like, um, would you vote for a candidate who, who doesn't want to protect your country um, versus, you know, um, or do you want to vote for a candidate who wants all your tax dollars to go for, you know, useless things or something like that. Uh, so there's various ways of, of um, you know, formulating these questions and we try to keep them as unbiased as possible. Now you want to be specific. So, yeah. Formulate the question. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you are at a stage, let's say you haven't actually searched the literature yet. Um, you're actually just working with your team to figure out what's the most important question that will be specific enough to give you an answer that's actually going to be usable. Right. All right, so some of the things you can think about here is be, be specific. So you, 
do you want to compare a specific length of hemodialysis to the same length of peritoneal dialysis, or do you just want to compare all dia all different types of dialysis? In which case, you know, you might be you might really be interested in this. Does does one kind of dialysis work better than the other? But if you get a little more specific, um, well, first of all, that narrows your question. It might be really what you're interested in. Um, you might really be interested in just three hours of dialysis. Maybe, maybe you currently do three hours of hemodialysis and you want to know if three hours of peritoneal dialysis is better. That might be your, your specific question. Or you might be interested in this, okay, well, um, in general, if I just let people do peritoneal dialysis for however long they want, and I compare it to the three hours that I'm doing, how well does that work? But now the problem might be that the studies you find, they, you may not have studies that actually looked at three hours. They might've looked at four hours or two hours or five hours. So you, you need to broaden those criteria somewhat to be able to, to use all the information that's out there. But you also have to balance that because if the three hour dialysis works differently from the four, you might wanna know that. Then another question is, are you looking at people who are being treated over several months or people who are treated for more than a year? Or are you looking at people who just started dialysis? So, you know, these different types of people might react in different types of ways. Some of your studies might have answers to some of those questions. They might have looked at different, different uh, durations. Mm -hmm. So the research plan should be specific about the doses that you're looking at, the durations, and the methods for delivering the intervention, the comparator. Because if you're not, if you don't have specific answers to these questions, then the, the end user doesn't really know um, if you just say hemodialysis works better, then they say, well, what, how long should I be giving it? You know, can I give it any way I want? Um, can I give it for five minutes? Um, you know, you, you need to be a little bit more specific on that so that you can give good recommendations. Okay, so at this point, we've, we've talked about the population, the intervention, the comparator. Our population is going to be adults diagnosed with stage five chronic kidney disease. Our intervention is peritoneal dialysis. Our comparator is hemodialysis. And now we go to the O, the outcomes. So the outcomes are the metrics we're using to assess the effectiveness and or the safety of the interventions. And they're yardsticks to determine objectively which treatment is better. So here I'm, I'm in a comparative situation. So some choices that you might use in this case would be how long do you live? How many times would you need to be hospitalized? Which have the fewest side effects or which give you the best quality of life? So these are all different types of outcomes. They're not all necessarily gonna have the same answer. So hemodialysis might actually lead you to live longer, but because you have to go into the clinic three times a week, it might give you a worse quality of life. It might also have fewer side effects, but it might lead to more hospitalizations, right? So when you're thinking about the outcomes you want to study, you want to be fairly um, lengthy in terms of your list because you want to be able to be important to consider all the things your stakeholders are interested in. They're not just interested necessarily in how long they're going to live. They might be interested in how well they're going to live. Um, they may be interested in um, something that's not even on your list, right? So this is where you want to have these people on your team so that you can ask them the questions of what's of interest to them. So that when your report comes out, it's, it's, it's most useful. Okay, so a completely specified outcome has several parts to it. Yes, question. Yes. Exactly. Well, you, you may or may not have enough information on each of these outcomes. For example, there might be 20 studies that report on length of survival and only two that report on number of hospitalizations. So you might be able to conclude something definitive on one and not the other. You're right that you cannot necessarily make the decision for the person, right? So you're laying out all the evidence for them. Um, so for example, let's say you're developing guidelines um, and the guidelines um, basically might say, well, if you're interested in this, then you should do this. And if you're interested in that, you should do that. 
Um, okay, so um, my colleague Ian Saldana came up with this nice um, sort of pie chart of um, elements of a completely specified outcome. I didn't generally like pie charts, but in this case, um, I think it's useful just as a, as a visual device. Um, so the first, the first idea is what's the domain that you're interested in? So for example, let's say you're interested in, in, in measuring anxiety, like or in, in our case, kidney disease. What's, what's the domain of the outcome? The second is, how are you gonna measure that domain? So for example, in depression, if you're gonna measure are people depressed or not, that's a pretty hard thing to measure, right? You could, you could say, are they eating well, or, but then you've gotta have a baseline. Um, do they look sad all the time? But then again, you've gotta have a baseline, you've gotta observe them. So there are these various scales that have been developed. One's called the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale. Um, so this is used oftentimes for depression, anxiety. And so you can use this um, and, and the score tells you, tells you and it's been a validated score, so it tells you how well that, how much that person's anxious. Um, the next question is, okay, you've got, the di you've got the domain and the measurement, now what's the specific metric you're gonna use? In this case, it's gonna be a change from baseline. So how much, how much did their anxiety change at the beginning of the study versus let's say after you've intervened on them? Hopefully it's gotten better. And then the next question is, well, how are you gonna aggregate all that together? Is it gonna be an average? So remember, these are systematic reviews. These are studies of lots of people. So you're measuring, you, you've studied 50 people and they, you've given them the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale and you've got the change from baseline of each person. And now what's the summary measure that you're gonna use for the systematic review? It's gonna be the mean change, let's say. That's report, what's reported in the paper. And then finally, when was this actually measured? Was the baseline three, is it three month follow-up, six month follow-up, 12 month follow-up? Maybe it's all of those and you wanna analyze them all. All right, now what are, what are some of the types of outcomes we look at? So hard outcomes are things that are objective and easy to measure, things like mortality or cure or passing a test um, or um, uh, being able to drive a car, you know, things that you can, you can really measure. Um, surrogate outcomes are intermediate outcomes. We've talked about this that are accepted markers for clinical outcomes or scientific outcomes. They're, they're oftentimes lab measurements um, and they may or may not be predictive of the clinical outcome. Hopefully they are, um, but they don't always line up. And then there are things called participant-centered outcomes, which are outcomes that the, the participants report and their importance to daily life. Um, and so, for example, if you're studying an intervention with somebody who's got chronic pain, you might be interested in, well, how well does this intervention control their pain, increase their energy, um, allow them to sleep through the night, without waking up and so forth. Now, in some studies, it's gonna be hard to do this. For example, if you're studying geckos, it might be a little difficult to get the gecko to tell you, you know, how well this intervention works for them. Um, but in, in human studies, this is very common and this is a very sort of modern thing, which is um, very, very commonly used now um, and uh, something that's, that's useful to think about. Okay, so now, Let's say that we decide that we've got our population intervention comparator and we're gonna look at six month mortality and six month infection rates following the start of dialysis. So our mortality is our, is our hard outcome and our infection rate is our safety or a bad, a, a adverse event outcome. So in other words, we'd like it if our intervention reduced mortality and also did not lead to more infections. And so our question, final question is, how does peritoneal dialysis compare with hemodialysis with regards to six month mortality following the start of dialysis for adults with stage five chronic kidney disease. Okay, so that's a pretty specific question now. We may or may not be able to get data on it, um, but hopefully by fo having followed this process, we've narrowed things down a little bit. And so, um, you know, we try to define things. Now, even this question may not be specific enough. And when you start going through the studies, you may find that there's um, lots of um, ambiguity here with regard to something. For example, give me an example here. So if I say six month mortality, that means mortality after six months, right? What is six months? Well, what if the study reports mortality at five months? Does that count as a six month study? Or what about seven months? Um, what if it gives three months and nine months? 
um, should I average the two to come up with six months or, you know, what do I do? So there's various things that you, you're probably going to have to be specific on in your protocol and the details uh, of some of these things. Also, you know, what, what exactly, how you define stage five chronic kidney disease. Um, you know, you might want to be very specific here and say it, it's an estimated GFR that's less than 15 um, or, it's, or it's or somebody who's been on a kidney transplant or whatever. Okay, now we go to the, the sort of extra letters. So we've got the PICO, now there's the D, the design. So this information is not typically, yeah, question. Back to the previous one, yeah. did you find that all the study reports of one year versus six months, is it good practice to change yeah. your thing or is it bad practice to right. change? So you might find that the, one of the criteria that you're interested in, you just don't have any information about, like the time. So you then have two choices, right? Let's say everybody reports 12 months, but only a few studies report six months. Okay, <clears throat> that's probably the more interesting way of thinking about it. So you know that if you do the 12 months, you're not gonna have any reporting bias because every study's reported it, but that may not really be the time point you're interested in. Um, if you do the six month, you know you've got it only on some studies. So you're, you're worried that the studies that didn't report at six months, it might've been because there was no difference or something, and so you're going to get a biased answer. Let's say you're able to rule that out, but still with six studies, you only, six months, you only have five studies, whereas with 12 months, you have 15 studies, and so you know you can get a much more accurate answer with 12 months. So it's, it's again, you, you sort of have to figure out, um, you might then want to report both of them and say, I can give you a good answer for 12 months. I can't give a very good answer for six months, but since that's what you're most interested in, I'm going to give you the answer anyhow but provide both. That's one, that's the kind of thing where the question could change over time. We were talking about that earlier. Um, okay. So the design is typically not in the formal question, but it's a crucial part of the research strategy. And so typically this is described in the inclusion and exclusion criteria um, by, for example, specifying what types of studies you're gonna include. I'm gonna include only studies that have randomized controls or studies that only have um, uh, that are cohort studies where people have been followed longitudinally or only studies where they have 12 months of follow-up. Um, so these are sort of design types of questions that you, you might ask. Also um, things like blinding, you know, are the participants aware of the intervention they're getting? Um, these, are, these are interesting questions for design. So randomized controlled trials are very commonly used in, in healthcare. Um, controlled trials are also used in a lot of other fields. Um, and, you know, the reason that they're harder in healthcare is because they typically involve people and it's very hard to get people to do what they're supposed to do. It's a lot easier in a lab to get your, you know, your machine to do what it's supposed to do or in the field you might be able to, uh, or in the lab you might be able to get your rats to, to do something because um, you can control them much better. So this is the gold standard for comparative effectiveness. And um, you typically want to take people with the characteristics you're interested in and you want to randomize them to the two, two or more groups, control intervention groups, and then compare the outcomes between the two groups. And the idea is by doing the randomization, you've balanced out the two groups so that they're alike in everything except for the intervention, and therefore any differences you find between them are due to the intervention. That's the idea. So that there's a causal interpretation. So ideally, you'll have enough randomized controlled trials to answer your research question. And there's certain individuals and groups um, that usually only work with randomized control trials. So if they find a systematic review or, or want to do a systematic review and they only find three randomized control trials, they might say, we don't have enough data to answer the question, even if there's 15 uncontrolled trials out there. Sometimes we can use the non-randomized data if there are not enough randomized trials or um, there are certain types of problems which are not going to be an answered by a randomized control trial. For example, if you want to know um, whether smoking is harmful, um, you cannot randomize people that either smoke or not. You know, there might be ways that you can come up with experiments that are sort of natural experiments, um, like maybe there's a population which does smoke and a population which doesn't smoke. Um, so for example, certain times, like certain religious groups which do not drink or smoke can be used as controls in certain settings, um, but these are natural experiments and they're not really randomized. You can't necessarily say that everything's been balanced out. And for exposures, we want to use comparative studies to answer a research question. In that case, we're, we're not going to um, be able to randomize, but we can hopefully get 
comparator groups that are similar. So if we want to answer a question like, um, you know, does driving at, to work at seven o'clock get you there quicker than driving at 7.30, um, then we can, we can take those two groups and we know they're not necessarily balanced because people who leave at seven are different from people who live at 7.30. For example, the people who leave later might have little kids at home and they've got to get to school, but we can still come up with comparator groups and maybe we can, we can stratify them to get rid of some of those differences. Um, and sometimes we can use the non-comparative research as a supplement. So for example, we can separately analyze the randomized and non-randomized and see if they get the same answer. So there's a lot of, a lot of information in the literature that shows that um, when you have uh, non-randomized data, you can sometimes get biases. Um, and, and this is because the people who participate in randomized studies are oftentimes different from the people who don't. And the, the women's health study was, is a famous example of this where um, it was known for years based on um, non-randomized studies that, that women um, who um, uh, got estrogen um, therapy or estrogen um, had reduced um, risk of certain types of diseases like heart attacks and, and cancers and so forth. And when they actually started randomizing women to either get or not get estrogen, they realized that this um, difference really didn't exist. And that the differences were because the women who got the estrogen were different from the women who didn't get the estrogen, and that's what the whole effect was. All right, so um, which studies will be most useful in answering the question? So here, we're, um, here our question is about, is about our dialysis, how does peritoneal compare with hemodialysis, six-month mortality, and so forth. Um, and so we might be interested you know, most there in looking at let's say, randomized control trials if we have them. Okay, so it's, um, it's 1030, and I forget exactly. Does, can somebody tell me how many more slides were left in this module? Because I, I could, I, three, all right, shall we just finish? We'll finish the module, okay. All right, so the next question is on the design. Okay, so which studies are you gonna include? We, let's say we decided to do randomized control trials. Now we might ask, well, how many people were in those trials? Should there be a minimum sample size? The idea here being that if the study is really, really small, it probably doesn't have a lot of information and it might not have been very well designed anyhow. Somebody might have just, it might have been a, a student who was doing a study and they randomized 10 people and it wasn't very carefully done and so we really don't want to include those kinds of studies anyhow and they really aren't very informative. Another uh, issue might be how long were, were people followed? So are we interested in short-term outcomes or long-term outcomes? Um, some outcomes can't be detected or measured right away, so we might need longer-term follow-up. Um, another question might be, when were the studies actually done? So a lot of times questions have been answered with studies over a long period of time, but older studies may be out of date because techniques have changed or conditions have changed or standards of care have changed. Uh, so for example, if you look at um, uh, how well, for example, does do mammograms work? There's a lot of studies from the 1980s and 1970s, but mammography was done very differently back then. And so they might be very not, if you were looking whether getting a mammogram every two years is better than getting a mammogram every one year or as good, um, the old studies may not be very um, useful to you because they, they use different types of films and different types of techniques and, um, and so forth. Um, so they may be not relevant anymore. Um, and it may not make any sense to combine the information among the time period. So chemotherapy is another example where, where drugs have changed a lot over time. And so the, the first line drugs back in the 1970s and 80s and 60s are, are very different from the drugs we get nowadays. So we're getting to the end here. We have our population is adults diagnosed with stage five chronic kidney disease, our intervention peritoneal dialysis, our comparator is hemodialysis. Our outcomes are six month mortality, six month infection rates from the start of dialysis, and we're using both randomized control trials and cohort studies. All right, so let's say that's what we've, we've defined. All right, so we started with the question, what's the best way to manage patients with kidney disease? And now our final question looks like this. So you can see it's much more specific. Um, as we said, there's lots of other details we might wanna put in here to be able to um, answer this question accurately. Um, but hopefully we'll have much more, um, we'll be able to find studies with this kinds of, these kinds of dialysis, with these kinds of timeframes, and these kinds of people 
much more easily and identify, for example, you read the paper and the paper says, we looked at stage three and four kidney disease patients, you know, right away that that study gets excluded. Whereas if you didn't have this properly defined, you might, some people might include it and other people wouldn't include it. And then you're, then you're going to, you're going to be caught in a, in a, in a, um, a lot of extra work. Okay. So let's start, let's stop there. Um, so we've done three modules. Um, this is sort of all the setup. And now we're going to get into sort of uh, some of the details of, of how you actually find it. Any questions before we stop? Okay. Tammy, how long do you want to break for? Ten till? Okay. Fifteen minutes. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Module four, search for and screen studies. So now we move over to the uh, second item on this process of We've now defined our topic. We now have our question. We now know what we're trying to, trying to look for. And now we're going to actually look for these studies. So the idea here is we're going to talk about searching and screening. And the idea of searching is how do you actually look through the literature to find all the studies that are relevant to your question? And what are the best practices for that search? and what's an approach to formulate a literature search. And then once you've identified the studies, you need to look through them to find out which ones are relevant. So we're gonna list best practices for literature screening and describe the steps for screening the literature. So the objective here is to maximize the amount of identified relevant information, obviously minimize the amount of irrelevant information and to minimize errors in literature identification. So the big, uh, issue here is you want to find all the studies that are relevant. So you need a fairly wide screening process, but you also don't want to find too much that's irrelevant because then you're going to have a lot of extra work to go through all those papers. So you want to come up with a process that's going to not miss anything that's important but also allow you to minimize the amount of work you have to do in, 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 your, in your systematic review. And you also want to avoid systematic errors in literature identification. For example, um, if you have certain eligibility criteria which you don't include in your search, um, then you might miss studies um, that you would otherwise have found. So before the process begins here of searching and screening. You've assembled your team, you review, you've reviewed the existing literature, and you've developed your clear research questions using the PICO criteria. You're now gonna operationalize those criteria um, to define clear eligibility criteria that will define what articles, what studies you're interested in, and then you're gonna devise a strategy to find those studies. So the first thing you probably wanna do is find a librarian or unless you're really good at searching yourself. Um, all I know is that you put a bunch of keywords and text strings together with Boolean operators. Um, I don't really know what's the best way to do that. For example, if I say A and B, um, that might work. But if I wanna say and B or C, do I, where do I put the parentheses? And then if I have certain things I want to search for and I don't want to, I want to not search for other things when there's, there's not commands. And so librarians are very good at that kind of thing. There's also certain keywords that are, that are, um, you can search for in certain databases. Uh, there, for example, in, in Medline, there's things called mesh headings. Um, and so if you don't know all those little tricks, uh, you may not do a very efficient search. So it's really good to find someone who's an expert in this stuff. We have a librarian on our staff. Um, so they'll help you identify the best databases for doing the searching. They will help you write these long strings of search terms to gather uh, your comprehensive collection of research related to your questions of interest. And they will help balance the comprehensiveness with some specificity so that you're not doing a lot of extra work. Yeah. We're, 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 well, I mean, if you're at a university, there's a university librarian who, you know, 
please just call up and I'll help you do these kinds of searches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if a, of a, of a general public librarian would have it, but, you know, if you're a trained, like most academic librarians at universities will, will have it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Right. I mean, the, the initial search is not a systematic one. Um, it might be just you've got experts. You say, are there any studies out here that you know are important? Or you might look at some of the key studies that people might know about just to see what some of the questions they've asked for. Um, as one of the earlier questions um, brought up, the, this process could could change over time. So you know, you might find that as you're doing this search, you're not finding anything, and so you broaden your criteria some to some extent. Okay, so when you're searching for the studies here, um, here, are, here are basically the six steps you're gonna go into. You're gonna first of all define your eligibility criteria, identify your databases and your sources, develop your search terms, structure your search, refine your search, and then document your search. So one of the things that um, there's, a, there's a flow chart, there's a guideline called PRISMA or systematic reviews. One of the things that they recommend, um, really require for a good review, is that you somewhere in that review list the exact search search strategy that you use, um, and, and and when I'm reviewing when I'm reviewing that analysis for for journals, um, I oftentimes will put in this request, please you know give me your search strategy. It's not enough just to say we search for randomized trials that look at patients with chronic kidney disease who you know had been on dialysis. Um, you want to know the exact search strategy because you want to make sure that the person has actually done a good search, right? If, if, if they've done um, a good search, then their strategy will reflect that. Um, if they haven't done a good search, somebody who knows how to search can look at it and say, no, that's not a very good search. Um, so it's just like documenting your statistical analysis. You need, you need to document all this. All right, so when you want to define your eligibility criteria, what studies are going to be included in the analysis? And these should obviously reflect what we talked about the analytic framework and the key questions. So things like, is, th is this going to be a broad or a narrow search? What study design should be included? Should we include studies in foreign languages? So very often you'll see in a systematic review, uh, we search studies in the English language. Now, why do people do that? Well, they do that because basically their team doesn't have enough foreign language experience to be able to extract the data from them. Um, Sometimes you'll see we searched in English and French uh, or English and German um, because maybe they've got somebody on their team who can read those languages. But that can lead to bias because you're excluding studies because of their language. Um, <clears throat> gray literature is literature that's not necessarily in a database, but you can find it if you search hard enough. For example, dissertations are a type of gray literature or abstract conference abstracts are a type of gray literature or government reports are often type of gray literature. So did you include that? Did you search for that? Um, what years of publication did you look for? Um, in other words, some of these databases go way, way back. Did you, did you search all the way back to the beginning of the database? What, most particularly, when was the last time you searched the database? So this happens a lot of times. You do a systematic review. Let's say you start it now, and you say, all right, I'm going to search for all studies through June of 2019. Um, now you, um, you finish your study up in December. You submit your article for publication. The first journal rejects it. It goes to the second journal. The second journal rejects it. It goes to the third journal. They're interested in publishing it. It's now June of 2020, right? And now your study is a year out of date. Um, so a lot of times, uh, reviewers like me will say, well, please update your search to be current, right? And so now you've got to go back and you know, re revise that. So you need, you need to 
could specify what those years are. And then finally, what resources do you have to conduct the search? So, you know, if your if your search is um, as as I said, you should you should get a librarian, although not everybody has one. Um, you should have access to databases. So, you know, if you work at a university, you typically have access to a lot of databases. If you work at companies, you may or may not have access to access to those databases. And then and then if you find the studies in the database, can you actually get the studies right? Because then you're then you're gonna, you're going to need the journals. And so now you're going to need things like interlibrary loan and all kinds of, uh, you know, or, or if you're just a, you're just sitting at home, you're retired and you're doing one of these things. Maybe I'll do these someday, but, but now I mean, I'd have access to the library. So um, think about all that. All right. So again, we're going to think about the PICO criteria here. Um, the, the initial inclusion exclusion criteria. What's the condition you're studying the disease severity stage be very specific on these things. What, comorbidities might you allow, patient demographics. So these would be obviously healthcare studies. Um, if you're doing a study in, um, in, in ecology, what types of organisms am I looking at in what kinds of environments, um, you know, in what years, in what seasons, all those kinds of questions. Um, <clears throat> for the interventions, we've talked about these. Um, you know, how long is the intervention going to be? How much is the intervention going to be? What types of interventions am I going to look at? What are the comparators? What are the outcomes? And what's the type of design? So those are all defined in your key question. Hopefully in your protocol, you, you will get more and more specific with this as you start extracting data. Um, I did a, a review years ago where we, we were trying to look at the characteristics of all the diagnostic test analyses, meta-analyses that have been done in the literature. We found about 700 of them. We set out to extract data from them. And some of our questions were very uh, broad, like, was there any spectrum bias? Was there any kind of inclusion bias? And we found out when the four of us, who were reasonably good at this sort of thing, put our answers together that we didn't agree at all on anything. And we realized that it was because we hadn't been very specific in defining what we meant by this or that or that. Right? So we, you know, I was, in, I was interpreting things one way, somebody else was interpreting things another way. So again, precise definitions are really, are really important here um, throughout. Okay, so you want to look at as many databases as you can. Some of these are free and some of them are not. Um, so in the healthcare literature, the typical ones that are looked at are things like Medline or PubMed, the Cochrane Library, Embase, um, CINAHL, uh, which is a, a, is a nursing database, and, and PsychInfo, which is a psychology database. Uh, education has ERIC. Um, I'm not familiar with some of the other areas, but um, there, there are major databases in all these fields. Obviously, Google you can use as well. The problem with using some of the um, less um, subject-specific databases is that they uh, may include a lot of things that you really don't want, right? That are, that are studies that are not true studies or they're not um, documented very well. Um, as I said, the gray literature is documents published by non-commercial sources like governments and nonprofit reports. These can oftentimes particularly in certain areas, have a lot of really useful information that you want to use. These were studies that were done, um, but they may not have ever been really published, or they were published as a technical report, but never really published in the, in the academic literature. Um, then there's other types of unpublished research that you might get from registries. So for example, there's a registry called clinicaltrials.gov, which is um, if you get funding from the federal government, um, you're supposed to, you have to, um, put your protocol and all your results online in a certain amount of time. Um, so those registries will oftentimes have information that's not in publications. Um, for example, um, let's say you have, you looked at 15 outcomes and you only reported five of them in your paper because that's all the journal had room for. Those other 10 might be in the registry. So that would be information that you get uh, online. Things like dissertations, uh, which people oftentimes um, may publish in part or not publish at all. There's a lot of extra information there. Um, conference abstracts, um, research that's in the file drawer, which means stuff that just got, never got published. But then there's also lots of, lots of reports that companies come up with. So if you, if you apply to the FDA for licensing of a drug, um, they will 
ask you to prepare hundreds of pages of a report. And, and those things, so the companies have these large, large reports, but of course they don't publish all the information in them. And they're often confidential, so they're hard to get a hold of. But if you can get a hold of those things, they oftentimes have a lot, have a lot of extra data that, that might be useful. Um, so what you really want to do is you want to use your stakeholders, your team, um, and your subject matter experts to identify what are the key sources you should be looking for. Um, they, may, they may know some themselves, or they may have colleagues that they know are working on certain studies that are in process that, that might actually be completed, but just not published yet. So sometimes you can find things that way as well. Okay, now let's move on to developing our search terms. So your search terms are the keywords that you're going to use that would define your PICO elements. So for example, if you're looking at chronic kidney disease, that would be a keyword. Um, or you're looking at dialysis, that would be a keyword. Um, but um, as a librarian who's good at searching will tell you, there's a lot of synonyms, right? So um, dialysis could come up as um, you know, kidney treatment. It could come up as peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis. Um, if you're looking for, um, uh, let's see, reading programs, you might they might come under reading, they might come under verbal, they might, so these are all synonyms that you, you, you need to look at. And, and so this is where you really need somebody who knows how to do these kinds of searches so that you don't miss things. Because if, if things are categorized uh, or cataloged under one term, but not under the other, you're gonna miss them, even though they're, they're really in the same field. Um, you, you also may be able to find related search strategies. So for example, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, protocol that's fairly close to yours that actually has a published search strategy that you can use. For example, if you're looking at cardiovascular disease and you want to look at um, outcomes that affect um, uh, for, for, for angina, but maybe there's a protocol for myocardial infarction for heart attacks that's, that's very similar. You can use that search strategy to, to kind of develop your own. Um, and then certain databases have specifically controlled vocabulary. So for example, Medline has the mesh terms. And so you can, by using those mesh terms, you actually use the way those databases are structured. And so you're gonna be able to find things a lot more easily that way than trying to come up with a whole new vocabulary that, that you may not be able to find things with. Now, your search, you're gonna take these keywords, these search terms, and you're going to combine them somehow. You're gonna combine them with Boolean logic. So you're gonna use things like and, or, and not. Um, I want um, studies that have chronic kidney disease, uh, and stage five, uh, and peritoneal dialysis, and hemodialysis, um, not early, not acute kidney failure, for example, because I don't want, I want chronic kidney disease, not acute kidney failure. So again, those are sorts of things that you need to kind of work, work out. So, you know, in, so the or thing means that any of these terms um, can, be, can be used. Um, so anything that has term three or term two or term one. Um, the, the shaded area there would be ones that are, you know, in the middle would be an and, right? So um, and term one and term two and term three is just the intersection of those three circles. Um, and, you know, this, this one on the left here might be a population. We want, want populations that have term one or term two or term three. Um, and here, um, all the, the, the population terms, um, all the intervention terms, all the comparative terms of a certain type, and we want all of them together, and so we, we have this intersection. All right, so for example, we might want population synonym one or population synonym two or et cetera, intervention synonym one or two, comparator synonym one or two, and then we might want to end those to say, okay, so if they have any of those P criteria, and any of those I criteria and any of those C criteria. So you're basically using your logic to put these elements together. And it's oftentimes useful to work within the letters because the letters define sort of sub areas. Um, and so you, it's much more easy to put together um, different types of interventions and then combine those with population rather than trying to mix the two together. And of course you can change any of these things. So the goal here is to try to identify um, as many 
relevant studies as you have without getting irrelevant studies. So you identify, you want to identify more um, false positives and negatives. Avoid, avoid missing any relevant studies. So you're going to start with a broad search, but then you're going to try to narrow your search if you don't have the time and resources to screen through the results. And in particular, um, you know, you might do your first search and it might come up with 50,000 hits. And you know that you don't have time to look through 50,000 abstracts to screen them, right? So you now say, okay, is there a way that I can narrow this search down? And so you might take out a couple of terms or you might say rather than saying or something, say and something, and now you're down to 500. You know that's too small. And so you try to find something in the middle that's, that's, that's an amount you can, you can get. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to miss anything. Now, what you might need to do is you might need to look at some of the hits you get to kind of see where the extra stuff is coming from, right? So there might be some synonym that you're using that just broadens things way too much. Um, so you're saying, you know, I want this or this or this, and that fourth thing that you or um, is just so broad. Um, so what's, what's a good example here? Um, I mean, there's a lot of words which kind of have double meanings, right? So let's say I was, I'm, I'm try trying to think of one. So, you know, the normal distribution of statistics, if you say I want something with the word normal in it, right, it's not just going to give you the normal distribution. It's going to give you anything with the word normal in it. Uh, so there's lots of examples like that. Um, you know, if you say you want, um, uh, let's see, eye disease, you're going to get a lot of hits, but if you want a particular type of eye disease, uh, you might be much better off going with specific types of terms. So um, those are just things that you kind of have to work out as you're, as you're doing this process. So these are all kinds of questions. Now, that as, you, as you're doing your search, it's not a sort of one-shot fits all. You have, to, you have to refine this search, and you have to try different things out. Is it too broad? Is it too narrow? Do you have the right study designs? Are you getting a lot of hits in different languages and so forth? And so this can help you uh, refine your search a little bit. So if you have too many records, you can add filters. Um, as I was saying, look for terms that might be exploding your search, making it too big. Um, identify what you don't want and narrow your inclusion criteria. So again, this means looking a little bit at some of your preliminary results uh, and seeing um, you know, what's, what's causing that. You might, for example, identify a study and look at it and say, why is this thing in here? I, don't, I, I, I wasn't searching for uh, this. And then you realize, oh, wait a second. I forgot to exclude animal studies. So, or I, I didn't include animal studies. And so you know, I've got these studies with rats, and I'm not interested in studies with rats. So, uh, or maybe you're interested in studies with rabbits, and, and you've got studies with rats in there. So you could say, not rats, and, 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 and get rid of that. Um, on the other hand, you might have a search that doesn't give you enough records, right? So you might need to include more synonyms. You might have been too restrictive in your terminology. You might need to remove quotation marks, because quotation marks oftentimes look for exact search terms. Um, use truncation. So for example, um, if you're looking for, um, so, so certain words have both prefix, prefixes and suffixes. And um, so, for example, if you're looking for a disease, it might come up sometimes as diseases. If you have, quote, disease, you'll miss anything with diseases. So if you put disease with a wild card, you can get anything that has that term in it. So there's, these are, this is why you need the librarians, because they know how to do this stuff. Um, you want to look for misspellings or alternate spellings. Um, you want to take off filters. So you might have restricted it very uh, uh, way too much. Um, or you might want to see whether your, your exclusion criteria are too narrow, right? Or you, you, may, you may want to see whether you, you have too narrow inclusion criteria or too narrow exclusion criteria. So if you're excluding things um, that, that are um, quite common, then you're, you're not going to, you may, you may restrict the, the, the size of the set that you're looking at too much. Okay, then the last point, the last part here is to document the search. So you want to, you want to provide a tail, detailed description of the search strategy. Um, you want to make sure that you've updated your search to be current. Um, 
So it's important that not only it's accurate, but also that it's transparent so other people can reproduce it if they need to. This reassures your stakeholders and your end users that your systematic review is free of bias and ensures also that it's reproducible, which is an important uh, component of science. So here's an example um, of where the di um, different databases were searched. So we searched, for example, Medline between um, 1947 and February 28, 2011. And the search was updated on April 4, 2012 um, using the Ovid SP platform. Um, or Embase, which was searched from 1976 when it started to April 11, 2011. Notice that those databases were searched on different dates. Um, and they were, but they were both updated to April 4, 2012. So your documentation will tell you what databases you used, what dates were covered, what the search terms were, your full electronics search strategy, at least for one database, um, any restrictions you put on it, like languages, languages or filters, how recently you updated it, and any non-database method used. So what that means is sometimes people will they'll go through the databases, and then in the articles that they retrieve, they will look for the reference list to see if there's any others they missed, right? So you may sometimes, let's say there's a, um, there's a definitive article and that may have references to other articles that you might have missed. Or you might do a backward citation search in one of these major databases. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. Yeah, I mean, it's very possible that let's say the data that come from Arkansas are just um, filed in a different way, right? Um, and so you might have missed it. I mean, it, it will really depend from problem to problem. Um, you know, if you if you kind of know that there's something there that's missing, then you're going to look for it a little bit harder. Than if you're not really sure if it's there. Um, but then in the end, you want to make sure that the database that you found for Arkansas is similar to the databases from the other states. Um, or, and you might even then want to go back to the other states and do that search to see whether you know, you've found any other hits um, that you think might be wrong. So typically, this whole process is going to be sort of detailed out in a flow diagram. So the PRISMA is the, I forget what it stands for, but it's basically the, I think it's preferred reporting items for systematic reviews, something like that. Anyhow, it's it's the it's the guideline that's used for reporting these things. And, and typically, these were these are the kinds of boxes you might have in such a flow chart. So, you know, the the the, the upper left box here says what were the records that identified through the database searching, um, and then the next item is additional records that identified through other sources, um, and then after. After you've got those two inputs, um, you then remove the duplicates because a lot of times, the, particularly if you search multiple databases, you're going to find the same paper in each database. Um, or you might have papers that um, are just, they turn out to be the same paper, but they're just referenced in two ways. Um, and then after you've done that, um, you screen all the ones that remain um, using the title in the abstract. Uh, so oftentimes you can just read the title and you can see right away that this paper is not relevant. For example, it might be a letter to the editor or it might be, um, it might be a commentary or uh, it, it might be um, just a news report or something on it. Um, and then after you've gone through the title and abstract screening, you, you exclude usually a lot of records here. Um, now you take the ones that you've continued and now you go and get these full text articles. So why do you get the full text articles? Well, one is you're going to need to extract the data, but the other is sometimes you can't really tell from the title and the abstract whether this is an article that satisfies your inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, for example, you want randomized trials that it's not really clear if this is a randomized trial or not. It might say it's a, it's a trial, but you don't know if it's randomized or non-randomized. So you're going to go get those full text 
And now you're going to screen those. And again, you're going to exclude certain things for certain reasons. And so typically you would want to, you'd want to make a list of what those reasons are. And you can be more explicit now because um, you've actually got the article, so you kind of know why you excluded it. So some might be it's, it's the wrong population, or it's the wrong design, or it's the wrong intervention, or it's the wrong outcome, or so forth. And then finally, you have your included studies that you're going to use for your review to extract. Right? So that's your, that's your final flow chart. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, you know, with multiple databases, should we search multiple databases? And then if we do, how do we document them? So typically, I think in this upper left box, I would list all the databases that I searched and the number of records I found, because then I'm going to get rid of these through the duplication process. So I'd want to say, you know, I found 2,000 records in Google Scholar, and I found 1,500 in Medline, and I found, you know, whatever. So that would be, that would be the way of doing that. Um, I would recommend multiple databases, although there is going to be a lot of overlap. So typically in our field, we would search Medline and probably the Cochrane Library and maybe Embase, although Embase is a, is a um, database that you need to pay for. So if your library doesn't have it or you don't have access to it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. Um, the Cochrane Library is good because it has a lot of randomized trials in healthcare. Um, in other fields, um, you know, probably it's good to do a, a subject-specific kind of database and then maybe a more general database. Uh, again, your librarian ought to be able to help you with, with this. Um, okay, so now you've done the you've done the searching and you've identified the articles that you think are relevant. Now you want to screen through them. And so how do we do that? So I've kind of introduced this in the idea that you first look at the titles and the abstracts, then you might refine your review a little bit, and then you do your full text screen. So typically, the screening process, you have a corpus or a database, that's corpus is kind of a computer science-y term for this. You have a corpus of abstracts that are identified through various sources. Um, now, there's two levels of screening. Level one, um, you're, you're basically just trying to identify from the um, abstracts, from the information you have, those articles that you think are relevant to go get, go and get. So there's going to be some manual screening, um, and then you will classify that into two groups. You've either screened in or screened out, right? So this is like a spam filter. You're trying to get rid of the things that aren't relevant. And then once you've got the screened in group, now you go to level two, now you get the full data text, and now you manually appraise the full text articles, and again, you get this inclusion of the group. Now, one of the nice things about this is that we actually are developing uh, tools now, machine term tools, that can actually do this for you to some extent. So I'll talk about one that we've developed, it's called Abstracker in a bit, um, which, um, it uses a machine learning tool to figure out kind of what is relevant and what's not relevant, provided you have some information to give it um, to learn from. Otherwise, this is a very long, tedious process. Um, in the old days, you used to print out paper and you just go through stacks of paper. Um, nowadays, there are tools that you can do this online um, and a little bit easier. You can highlight certain words and, and make it a little bit easier for yourself. So this is a little bit small type, but the basic idea here, this is a particular flow chart that um, was published in an article in, in JAMA in, in 2007, um, which was looking at um, a, a literature search. And so typically for a large review, you're going to have five to 15,000 identified articles, 200 to 1,500 articles that you would retrieve in full text. And then you'd have between 10 and 200 eligible, depending on how, how narrow or how widely focused or broad your question is. So in this particular diagram, they found 16,000 references 
and then they split them out into how many they found in the Cochrane Central, the Medline, the Embase, the Web of Science, and in reading bibliographies. So they were pretty thorough here. Um, then they excluded about 15,000 of those, and they tell you why they excluded them, um, for either because they were duplicates, which was a large number, or they were not relevant, or they were trials involving patients with cancer, um, except non-melanoma skin cancer, which is, I think, what they were looking at here. Um, trials involving acute and infectious diseases, trials, trials involving infants and children, and trials involving pregnant and lactating women. So these were all exclusion criteria for their, for their review. That, that left them with 1,200 references, which included 815 trials. And um, among those, they found 16, 68 um, that were relevant, and they excluded 747 um, for various reasons, either no deaths in any group, uh, they didn't fulfill the inclusion criteria, they weren't randomized, uh, there was insufficient data, or there were ongoing trials. Now, some of these reasons are, I think, valid, and others I might question. So, for example, insufficient data. Um, the reason there might be insufficient data is because somebody didn't report a certain outcome that they were interested in, so that might be actually a reporting bias issue. Uh, in other cases, it might be that um, if they had contacted the investigators, they would have been able to get more information. Maybe they should have done that. So um, I think in some of these cases, you might question um, some of their decision making. But for now, this would be the flowchart um, you know, as they come up to show you how they went from 16,000 to 68. So at level one, when you're looking at the abstracts, you want to you get, a, you get a team of screeners. So typically you want to do this in duplicate at least. You want to just have one person doing this. Um, so the gold standard is to have at least two people review each abstract. Um, now, a lot of times people will do sort of shortcuts on that, particularly if these are quick and dirty types of meta-analyses. If students do it, they often do this themselves. They might get a colleague to help them out. You can find somebody uh, to do that. And so you're going to first create your screening criteria. Um, and so um, you're going to focus on abstracts that include elements of the, the, the population, the intervention, the comparator, or the design rather than the outcome, because the outcome is a little bit hard to tell oftentimes in the abstract. Um, so you don't want to exclude things based on the fact that they don't have the outcome, because the outcome might be in the paper, but it just isn't in the abstract, whereas the, the other elements are typically in the abstract. Um, at, this, at this level, you want to be more conservative, meaning, you know, let's say Let's say you're looking for studies in children and the abstract doesn't say what the age range is. You, you wouldn't throw it out just because it doesn't say it has children because it might actually have some children. And it's usually good to begin with a pilot round here, meaning that you, you've sort of, you've sort of um, advised your team on how you're going to screen. And so just do a few together. Maybe take 50 and I'll do them and, and just see if you agree. Because okay, if you start disagreeing, then you may need to revise your criteria a little bit. Um, make sure that your screeners are consistent, and then go ahead and do your actual screening. Now, one thing with the machine learning tools is that you can sometimes use them as a second screener. So you could, you could screen them all um, and then have the machine do some of the screening and see if you get the same answers. Okay, now you've got, you've got your abstracts screened out. And now you go get the full text articles that you think might have relevant information. And now you do the same sort of thing as above, um, but you're, you're now more particular because now you have the full information in the study. So you're able to go through all your criteria. And you're going to now record your rejections, your reasons for rejecting studies, right? So um, according to the eligibility criteria that you set out. So what are the tools that you can use for screening? So most people probably in the past have used a spreadsheet like Excel. Um, it's easily available. Um, you just create columns. Um, and uh, you, know, you might um, use it to uh, screen studies in and out. Um, it's kind of cumbersome and error prone. Um, and you know, it's easy to, easy to screw up. So there's other tools that are, are a little bit easier to use. So there's, there's one program called Distiller which is web-based software for citation screening and data extraction. And it's got very helpful features for managing and tracking your screening forms, reviewer conflicts, and ultimate flow of study. So for example, this will actually load the abstract in 
you can read it online, you can check whether it's in or out, and everybody else can do the same thing, and then you can, you, it's easy to compare them at the end, see where you disagree and you don't agree, um, you can highlight things and so forth. The problem is that it's a, it's a commercial product and it's kind of costly. So some, some places have it and some don't. We actually have a product called Abstractor that you can get on our Brown website. It's free, um, it's open source, and it's a web-based screening tool. Um, and what it does is it's, it's similar to Distiller. Um, so you, you tell it, for example, what the articles are that you want it to load into the system. Goes out. If you're using PubMed, for example, you just need to give it the PubMed IDs. It'll go out and find all those abstracts, brings them into the system. Um, it will then present the abstract um, on the screen for you, and uh, you can then screen it out. And at the bottom, it gives you a little checkbox. Do you want to keep it? Do you want to exclude it? Are you not sure? Um, it also has tools available for highlighting certain words. So, for example, let's say you're looking for randomized controlled trials. You can have it highlight in green every time randomized control trial comes up in any abstract in the, in the database. And then, so when you're reading it, oh, there's, there's the green randomized control trial. Okay, I guess that one's okay. Um, or maybe you want to have some things in red that are things you want to exclude. And it's also got a machine learning tool um, that uses a support vector machine to, to classify articles. And so the way that works is, let's say you found 10,000 abstracts. Um, you might screen 400 of them manually, and then you put those uh, decisions into the system, and then you tell the system to go off and classify the remaining ones. So it will try to figure out, based on um, its black box logic, um, what, you know, what, what are the key characteristics that separate, let's say, the 20 that you said are okay from the 380 you said were not, and it will, it will give you predictions for the remaining 9,600. And you can, it will then rank them for you in terms of which ones it thinks are most likely. You can then start reviewing those and, and continue refining that. And what we found is eventually in a lot of cases, by the time you've screened about 50% of them, you can be pretty sure that the rest, there's nothing left. So, uh, you know, some people would like to, like to go all the way through, but you could also use this as a way to, as a way to check uh, another screener. Um, so, you know, this is the part of the, flow diagram we're at here. Uh, we've screened a certain number of records, and now we, we figure out whether these are excluded or included. Now we move on to the full text screening. So here we're going to read each article in full to determine eligibility. That's a, not really totally true, because you probably don't really, really need to read the whole article. You probably, what you really need to read is the methods section that will define exactly what they did. Um, you want to do this. Um, either prior to or in parallel with data extraction. So this is sort of an interesting question. If you, if you found 500 articles, but you were pretty sure that a lot of them were not going to really be in your final set, um, you just hadn't been able to exclude them with the amount of information in the abstract, and you start reading those 500, you probably don't want to start extracting all the data that you want right away. Because you're going to be wasting a lot of time. You'll start extracting information. And you'll say, wait a second, I don't want this article anyhow. So why they extract it. So it's probably a good idea to kind of quickly look through the articles um, and try to screen out the ones that you don't want before you start extracting. Um, there probably will be cases where you start extracting the data and then eventually you realize, I don't really want this study, but it wasn't obvious from the beginning. Um, but it's a good idea to, to kind of try to do these somewhat in parallel um, so you're not wasting time. And then obviously you continue to record the reasons why you, you reject the studies. And that's important for a few reasons. Um, one is obviously to be transparent, but the other is that sometimes you will go back and you will change your inclusion criteria, right, in, in, in the process, because you might find in the end, oh, I only found three studies, something's too narrow here. So now there might be some studies that you formally rejected for a reason that you now want to include. So if you've got the reason, it's easy then to figure out which ones to look at, right? Ones that, ones that are excluded because they're animal studies, you don't need to look at again if you're only looking at human studies. Ones that are excluded because they were missing a certain outcome, you might now want to include if you're going to include that outcome, right? And so then you would document all that in your, in your flow diagram. All right, so the summary here is that this can be a really tedious process. Um, it's, it's obviously foundational to the systematic nature of a systematic review. Um, and so 
you know, when people think of what does systematic review means, this is kind of this is kind of what they focus on. That you've gone through the literature, you've you've you have a scientific strategy to identify every single study that would be relevant. You have rules of engagement. You follow those rules, and you only take those studies that fall, you know that, that that meet your criteria. So we use Pico D as a, a search strategy and as a screening criteria. Um, redundancy in screening helps for quality control. That can either mean searching multiple databases, having multiple screeners, looking at things in various ways. There's various experts and tools to assist you. So you want to develop a search strategy with an information scientist or a medical librarian. You can use programs like Abstract or to screen citations. And you use reporting guidelines like Prisma to, to let you know what you'll need to report and what you should do. So the key idea is to follow a protocol, track your flow of citations, and any iterative decision making, and report it. To go backwards, yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, so, you know, the, the comment was that basically if you if you start with doing some extraction on some key studies first, um, you can learn a lot that will help you inform the process, and, and that's true. And I think one way to think about that is, you know, in the beginning when I was talking about preparing the topic and talking with your stakeholders, your stakeholders are your experts. Presumably these experts have read these papers, and so that they know some of this stuff. Um, but oftentimes in that early process, yes, you do want to look at some of the key papers um, and, and, and try to get a sense of like what the outcomes are, what the, what the people included are, and what information is actually available. Because um, if the key papers don't have it, I mean, another way to think about this is if there are four or five key papers in the literature that you know that people are going to want to see in the systematic review, um, and those key papers do not have certain information they really want, then you probably can't look at those items. Because even if you found them in the other studies, you'd be missing them from the key studies. Whereas if you have them in the key studies and you're missing them in a couple of the minor studies, then that might be much easier to do. And by key studies, sir, I mean studies that are typically either newest or, 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 or most cited or are biggest or whatever. They're the, they're the fundamental studies. Um, a lot of times when you do a systematic review, people will know about several studies that might be slightly different in terms of their conclusions. And so they want to do a systematic review to figure out what the, really the right answer is. Um, and in the process of doing the systematic review, they found a bunch of other studies they didn't know about that had also been done in the topic. Um, but those studies may have been you know, done at different times and in different ways. And so they may not have all the information from the key studies. So it's important to include those studies, but you may not be able to get everything you need out of them. Okay, any other? Okay, so we'll move on to module five then. So now we've got our studies. We've decided um, there are 68 studies, I think, in that flow diagram we looked at. Now we need to get the data out of them. So we're at, um, we're sort of halfway there. Uh, we're now moving over to the extracting the evidence from the studies uh, and uh, to try to construct the, uh, the evidence tables. So we're going to describe and and practice, the, well, we're actually not going to practice. This was, I, I should have eliminated that because in, in the data CDC, they actually had two days and they did some practice. Um, but we won't actually practice um, the process steps for data extraction. We'll list the key information to extract from studies, show how to create a data extraction form, and list best practices for extracting the data and for controlling the quality. All right, so here's just a review of where we are. Um, and uh, we've now 
added on our search and screen um, for studies, and we're now ready to extract data. So we want to transform piles of studies into digestible, organized pieces of information. Right? So studies are long. They have Typically, they'll have an introduction, they'll have a method section, they'll have a results section, they'll have a discussion section. Um, there, there'd be an, there's going to be a ton of tables and figures. There's going to be references. There's going to be all sorts of things. And while that's all very important, and the interpretation and the introduction are, are necessary to understand the article, um, it may not be important for your systematic review. So you want to pull out the important information from the systematic review. So you want to systematically review every included study and pull out the details that will help to answer your question. All right, so before we get into what you should do, just to be aware, there's a few complications. So first, reporting is not ideal. It can be inconsistent, it can be incomplete, and it can be ambiguous. <clears throat> you may need to interpret author's intentions, make judgments, standardize numbers, etc. And the job of the reviewer is to bring the evidence together in a way that meaningfully answers the questions of interest by maximizing the use and identification of study data, preferably high quality study data, and to minimize introduce by introducing bias um, from the ways you review. So what do we mean here by um, you know, in this interpretation? I'm gonna show you some, some um, examples in a minute. But sometimes, for example, to give you a very concrete example, um, randomized trial. So there's good ways to do randomized trials and there's bad ways to do randomized trials, right? So one of the criteria in a randomized trial is, do they actually do a, a appropriate randomization? So sometimes people think randomization just means alternating between the two treatments. You know, we know what randomized means. Or, um, they might have randomized things by flipping a coin or picking things out of a hat or running using a random number generator. So some of those are better ways than others of randomizing. And it, sometimes it's not really clear from the article whether they actually did it appropriately. They might say this is a randomized control trial, but they don't tell you how they did the randomization. So when you're answering the question about is this a randomized control trial, the answer might not really be yes. It might be I'm not sure. Right? Other times, data that are reported might be ambiguous. For example, um, they might tell you that the study involved 49 people. Um, and then in the analysis, in the tables, you only see a total of 45 people analyzed. So it's not really clear what, what the sample size is. Other times, um, you know, numbers may be reported from scales and you don't really know what the range of the scale is or whether the scales are actually compatible. <clears throat> so why extract the data? Um, can I just read every study and summarize results in a report? Well, clearly, if you want to do some statistical analysis of it, you're going to have to have things in a, in a standardized fashion. So here's where the systematic part is crucial, because you want to systematically consider and weigh the existing evidence. And the only way to really do this um, to generate meaningful quantitative summaries across your meta-analysis or your systematic review of tables and graphs is to do this systematically and to make sure that all the numbers agree. So if, um, for example, um, to, be, to be very modern about this, if you have an extraction form which has how many men and how many women are in each study, or what's the percentage of males in each study, and five of the studies report males and females, and five of the studies report males, females, and other, meaning sort of non-binary non gender, um, then how do you classify this? You know, percent male now, is it percent male out of the total number? Percent who identify as male? Um, you know, what, what, what are you defining? And so you have to be very clear on those kinds of things. So there's this quote from Jessica Gervich and Larry Hedges um, in a book, and they talk about, it's an eye-opening experience by attempt, to attempt to extract information from a paper that you have read carefully and thoroughly understood, only to be confronted with ambiguities, obscurities, and gaps in the data that only an attempt to quantify the results reveal. So the idea is you can read a paper through, and it looks great. The conclusions are very clear. Um, you understand what question they're answering um, and, and what, they, what their conclusion is. 
Um, but then when you start looking at it really, really carefully, you realize, wait a second, I'm not really sure that they actually analyzed the, the same number of people they randomized, or this survival curve doesn't look quite right because these lines cross, but they're not supposed to cross, or they, for example, used um, one kind of a technique, but it doesn't look like they shouldn't have used that kind of a technique, or um, these studies um, uh, were um, in the wrong population, they really shouldn't have been there if I read these inclusion criteria really carefully. So as you pull out and organize the data from each study, you're going to notice errors and mistakes that you might have missed. Right? So this is you're going through it with a fine tooth comb now. And the inconsistencies can play a large part in the final conclusions about the reliability and quality of studies. So every re well-reported study is not necessarily well done. And every well done study is not necessarily well reported. So you don't know that just because they reported things badly that the study was actually poorly done. Um, however, it may be clear from the way they did report it that they weren't very careful about what they did. So here's an example. Data for 40 patients who were given all four doses of medications were considered valuable for efficacy and safety. The overall study population consisted of 10, 40% 40% men, and 24, 56% women, with a racial composition of 38, 88% whites, and 5, 12% blacks. Okay, so how many patients were in the study is the question. This is actual, this is actually published. All right. So, you know, clearly there are 10 men and 24 women, that's 34 total people, but they said there were 40 and there was 38 whites and 5 blacks. So there could be reasons why this is occurring. For example, some people might have identified as both black and white, right? And some people might have identified as non-male or non-female, but it's unlikely given that they didn't say this. Here's another one. A study focused on adults only aged 18 to 18, right? So there's obviously a typo there. They, 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 made, they met 18 to 81, who knows? Um, so how, many, how old were the participants in the study? We don't know. Um, here's another table. So these are demographic characteristics of evaluable patients. Um, so there's two treatment groups, uh, roxithromycin and clarithromycin. Um, there's 100 patients in the roxithromycin group and 95 in the clarithromycin group. Um, and so we have the male and the female breakdown, and we have the age and the weight. Okay, so can anybody see um, an issue here? Right, so the, the, um, the weight here, um, yeah, the weights look okay, but the, um, the ages, you've got the mean age is 39 and 40, but the ranges are 47 to 90 and 48 to 90. So again, there's something wrong here with the data. So um, you may or may not have checked this when you were reading the paper, right? Because you might have just quickly looked at this and said, oh, okay, people were about 40 years old and they were about 40% male and 50% or 40, it was pretty much 50-50 on the male-female, and the weight they weighed about 66 kilos on average. Okay, great, and this went on. Right? But now you start to extract the data, and your extraction form has mean age and range, and wait a second, what is the mean age? I don't really understand. Okay, here's another one, um, looking at three different treatments. Here, fish oil, mustard oil, placebo. Um, on aspirin, we have 20. Um, on aspirin 24 and 21 in the three groups. But then down below, we have drug therapy, aspirin 110, 112, 116. So again, there's a reason, these numbers are different, right? So there's a reason these could be, could be um, like this. The, these could mean different things because the, the one below is drug therapy, um, but it's not really clear from this table what's the difference between being on aspirin and having aspirin for drug therapy. So again, unless that's the, Clear, clarified in the text, you probably need a footnote here or something, or maybe you need to call it something else if it's slightly different. So, you know, where do these errors come from? Well, they come from typos, from copy and paste. There's lots of different ways that they can, you know, enter into the system. And sometimes you can figure out what they meant, and sometimes you can't. Um, and obviously, different people, you know, write studies. You've probably all worked on papers where, you know, errors just creep into things. We had one the other day where somebody sent me a, um, you know, one of the reviewers found some, something that was inconsistent and I realized that, you know, we changed a table um, from going from one version to another and something 
you know, we change one part of the table but not the other part of the table. Like we change the mean and not the confidence interval or something like that. So these things happen. Um, now, another problem is that um, these errors may be difficult to figure out because the methods are not well reported. And that could be for a variety of reasons. A lot of times journals are very um, tight, right? They don't give you a lot of room to write things up. So the, the, the methods don't get completely described. Um, reporting standards um, have evolved over time. So um, articles typically now, at least in the top journals, are much better reviewed than they were in the past. And there are certain guidelines people follow. And so therefore, if you are doing a systematic review over time where you have old articles and new articles, the old articles may have a very different type of standard, right? And so the information that you have in the new articles may not be available in the old ones. And then another thing is that terminologies can change in the field. So, you know, something that was called kidney disease is now called renal disease. And, you know, they might be the same or they might not be the same. Um, something, you know, one, one, one article might talk about four-legged creatures and another talks about, you know, uh, mammals. And so you don't know whether, you know, what, what, whether they're the same. So what data are you needed? You need PICO um, to, to guide your data extraction variables. You know, what specific people or conditions are included in the research? What treatments, tests, or other interventions are being studied? Your comparators, your outcomes, uh, your design, the timing, the setting. Um, and also bibliographic information about each paper is also very useful because then you can look things up. So for the population, you need information about participants to compare the similarity of the included studies to make sure that they really are looking at the same types of people and they really, when you extract the information, you really think these things are combinable. To ensure a balance of randomized groups if it's a randomized controlled trial or potential confounding if it's an observational study. Um, so you might, for example, want to exclude a study because you, it wasn't properly randomized. Um, and you can really only do that if you have the information um, from those groups. Um, and then you might, we haven't really talked about heterogeneity, but if you want to start looking at subgroups, um, like for example, I want to know if this particular intervention works better in kids who are 5 to 10 and kids who are 10 to 15, then I need to know something about their ages. And so I need to extract that information. So things like age and sex and other de demographic information or the severity of a condition or the, um, the, the setting something's in or uh, the, the number of comorbidities a patient has, um, looking at, um, for example, in a classroom, you might want to look at how many kids are special needs. Um, in a, in a, a criminal justice system, you might want to know, you know what crimes were these people um, imprisoned for. Um, you know, in a study of HIV AIDS, you might want to know how many of the people are drug addicts uh, or not. So these are all kinds of subgroups that you might be interested in looking at and you might want to extract information on. Um, so in, in, in the intervention and comparators, since those are typically the, the similar in terms of the data you'd extract for them. Um, typically, if it's a comparative study, they'll have two arms. Um, arm is usually the term that's used in you know, randomized study. Um, sometimes you'll hear uh, exposure groups. Um, and you want to extract the same type of information from each arm so that you have a fair comparison. So in particular, you might want to know if it's a, a usual intervention and an enhanced intervention, you might want to know the dose um, of the two. Um, so again, in, in a medical versus a surgical um, comparison, you might want to know things like for the medical intervention, what drugs were used, the doses, the frequency, and the process of drug administration. Um, for the surgery, you might want to know what kind of surgery was done, how it was performed, the types of materials used, the experience level of the surgeon, and the anesthesia protocol. Um, if you're looking at behavior change, you might want to know what the intervention was, how it was delivered, how frequently and intensely it was delivered, and the types of materials that were used. Or for an exposure, you might want to know what the exposure is, how long and how intense was the exposure, and, and how was the exposure transmitted. Um, so again, if it's, a, if it's a, an air quality study, um, are you talking about quality of air you know, in cars? 
from, from chemical factories, um, all of the above, um, you know, over, over what periods of time and in what kinds of um, doses. Um, and then for the outcomes, what do we want to extract from the outcomes? Well, we want to know, um, we want to be able to compare the outcomes for these different interventions or these different arms. So um, we, we need to be very clear on how we're going to extract the outcome data. Um, so we start with a list of key outcomes. Um, and what's the most important information for each research question? Right? So if we're looking at um, mortality, then it's very clear we need a count of lived and died. If we're looking at quality of life, then the question would be, well, what, what scale are we using to extract the quality of life? There are oftentimes multiple scales, and not every study is going to use the same scale. So what do we do when we have studies with different scales? Um, they're not necessarily comparable. One scale might go from 0 to 100, and one scale might go from 0 to 10. Sometimes you can just num multiply the numbers in the smaller scale by 10 to make them on this, but that might not be valid either because the cut points might be very different on the scales. So, you know, sometimes there are, there are studies which actually validate these scales, which actually can compare them. So you can say, okay, a 10 on this scale is like a 12 on this scale. Um, sometimes you don't have that. And so there are a variety of statistical techniques you can use like standardized differences um, where you can sort of statistically scale things to the same level. Um, but it might very well be that um, you've decided to use uh, any one of three scales as an outcome, but it turns out that all but one of your outcomes use one of the scales. And so you might decide, well, I'm just going to use that one scale and just exclude the study that uses the other scales just so that I can be very sure that I don't have any problems with compatibility. All right, so again, for all these things, you may need to go back and revise your protocol after you start extracting the information um, because you're going to find things that you haven't. All right, so for example, how do the study authors define the outcome? What counts, let's say you're looking at severe bleeding, what counts as severe bleeding? Is it a blood transfusion? Is it something that requires a hospitalization? Um, is it something that requires hospitalization for a certain number of days? Um, how is the outcome measured? Is it yes or no? Is it number of times? Is it good, fair, or poor? Is it a continuous measure like, you know, Leaders of or uh, leaders lost or something of something. What, how is the information about the outcome collected? Were there tests done? Was it observational? Was there a survey where people asked? Was something actually measured? Was there a provider who who was who was um, who was asked? Um, what type of outcome is it? And what are its psychometric properties? Is, was it an objective outcome? A subjective outcome? Was there any validity or reliability test if it was subjective? Um, why was, when was the information collected? Was it immediately after the intervention, 24 hours later, six months later, years later? Was there follow-up? Was it collected at the same time for each person, right? It might have been um, whenever it was reported within six months, or it might have been everybody at six months. Um, some of the studies might have been early. Some of the studies might have been late. What units were measured, used to measure the outcome? Um, pounds or kilograms, inches or centimeters? Uh, who determined that the outcome happened? So a lot of times, you know, there was a, so they might say there was a cardiac arrest. Was that determined by a nurse or a doctor? Uh, was it determined by, or, or, or maybe there was a, um, so I'm, I'm working in a study right now where we're looking at atrial fibrillation. So that's heart flutters, heart murmurs. And so the question is, how often do individuals have these in a given day? So one of the questions is, how do we report that? Um, so the patients are gonna wear a monitor which is going to record it. They're also going to tell us verbally how many times they, they had this symptom in a given day. Um, so we're going to have two different reports, and they may or may not agree. Uh, another study I was working on, we were looking at uh, timing of, of people to extract. Actually, we were looking at extracting data in a systematic review and different ways of doing it. And one of the outcomes was the time it took. And so how did we measure the time? Well, we had people write down how long they spent. We also had a monitor on the computer. Um, to calculate the amount of time they spent. Well, these turned out to be quite different because um, when people were extracting the data on the computer, they oftentimes got up to take a break and they didn't shut down the computer, so the computer kept counting, right? Whereas, you know, 
but when they were reporting their time, they oftentimes, you know, got it wrong, right? They they thought they spent 10 minutes and they really spent 20. So um, you know, we didn't really have a, a definitive measure of that. We sort of analyzed it both ways. Okay, so then other things that you might, so now you've gone through the PICO criteria. Now what about the design, the timing, and the setting? Well, um, so you want information about the conduct of the study. Um, you know, how was the study done? Where was it done? Who, who were the people who were doing the surveys? Um, if you had, you had research assistants collecting the data, were they well trained? Um, how, was, how was the data quality monitored? Um, so this helps inform, you know, how good the study is and how much you can believe the results. So some examples are like the study design. Um, how, how was the study designed? What were the components of it? Uh, when and where was the research done? Uh, what dates, when was it done, where was it done, the type of um, either the health service or the type of school or the type of prison or uh, the type of um, office environment. Um, how was the random generation of the randomization scheme and also the allocation sequence and the blinding done? So allocation concealment is an important item. Not only do you need randomized numbers, but you also need to make sure that people don't cheat and look at the randomized numbers. So we often put the, 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 um, uh, the randomized assignments into envelopes or something that people can't have to open so that they can't um, say, well, you look like you should be in that group, so I'm going to put you in that group because I know that's the next randomized number. Um, length of baseline assessment, particularly if you're trying to compare a change, you want to know, well, how long, for example, let's say you're looking to, to see how well a certain diet works. So I'm, I'm involved in a study right now with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, where one of the outcomes is the number of times that people have to go to the bathroom every day. Um, and so the baseline is a two week uh, period when they're just doing their usual diet. Um, that will give us enough time probably to get a good average level of what their, um, what their daily um, uh, stool frequency is. Um, if we did it for one day, it, we might have randomly higher low numbers. Um, <clears throat> How was the intervention delivered? Was it delivered in a blinded fashion? Um, did, did, was it delivered by um, a, a patient? Um, and now we're getting to these mobile application devices where you tell people to do something on a certain day um, and they, they either do it or don't, but um, it, they're being prompted by every day by a device. Or the follow-up. How are you gonna handle the missing data? So, um, as I was saying, a lot of studies will report a certain number of individuals in the study, but then when you look at the analyzed number, it's less. So that means that there's certain people who aren't analyzed. So how are you going to handle those people? Or what if, um, what if you know that there were 80 people analyzed, but a particular outcome was only analyzed for 60 people? What, about, what do I do about the other 20? And they may actually tell you why the other 20 weren't there. The, the instrument broke, or, um, or these people came in after hours, and so we couldn't get the information. So how are you going to handle all that? And, and how are you going to record that it was or wasn't uh, collected? And then also the sources of funding to get at the conflict of interest issue. Okay, then when you move on to the results, um, you're going to extract information on the findings of, of the statistical analyses and the raw data on your outcomes of interest. So um, some of the things that you might want to extract are things like the sample size, how many people are analyzed, the mean difference between two groups, Standard deviations and errors. So typically in a meta-analysis, you need to know not just the average, but also the variability so that you can, you can, you can get a comparison of the two. Um, those are oftentimes not reported. Confidence intervals, counts of events, odds ratios and risk ratios, regression coefficients, what models were fit. So we're going to talk about all this more tomorrow, but these are just some of the things um, that you may need to extract and that may be very difficult to extract because um, it may not be very clear uh, again, the numbers may not may not match up. Um, I've come across a lot of times situations where a proportion of something is reported with a denominator, and there's no way that denominator can lead to that proportion. For example, there were 11 people in the study, and 30% had something. Well, 30% 30, 30 of 11 is not an integer, and these are people. This is just, there's just no way this can happen. And so these are, these are kinds of things that you run into. So remember your question and your synthesis goals. Always return to your question and its ICO criteria when you're extracting the data. Uh, ensure that your data that you're extracting 
can and will be used to answer the question. Um, don't collect more information than you need to. This process is painful enough without, without trying to you know, write the whole paper down in the spreadsheet. But don't collect too little either. Um, you know, in particular, um, there's certain information that you'll need to be able to do certain calculations, and you may need to, you may need to collect more than you think you're going to need to. Um, and anticipate and prepare for variation reporting. So, um, you know, some studies might report a standard error. Sometimes it might, some might report a standard deviation. Some might report a confidence interval. So you have to kind of decide in your data extraction form what are those. Let's take the standard deviation, standard error, and confidence interval. Um, you know, if you have the amount right information, like the sample size, you can go back and forth between them if you know what the analysis is. So you might actually be able to program your extraction form so that if you enter one, it automatically calculates the other. Or it might be that you do this by hand and you enter it in. But you might also just have your form record whatever information is in the paper. And then later on, when you're doing the analysis, you can convert it. So you just have to decide what to do there. But make sure that you, for example, just don't write down, if you have a column that says standard error, but it's actually a standard deviation, make sure that you note that it's a standard deviation so that later on you don't forget. So with the interventions and comparators, um, informa information on these is going to help determine which studies can be combined together um, using the meta-analysis. So you're only going to combine things that are, that are actually comparable. Um, you're going to collect dosing data to investigate the relationship between the amount and the frequency of any intervention and response, so the dose response. And the number of patients in each arm is going to be important because that's usually essential for analysis but also for quality assessment to make sure that you know, everybody who's analyzed, you should have been. Um, and in particular, when you have follow-up studies, make sure that the numbers at baseline and follow-up and any reasons for loss or follow-up um, are, are reported so that you, um, you know that those analyses are done correctly. So the, you know, it's a good idea to have a data extraction form. Every form should be customized to reflect the research topic and the, and the key questions. Um, it should be organized logically with sections for each element uh, in, the, in the PICO and, and bibliographic information. Like the bibliographic information would be the authors, the title, uh, but also maybe the year published. Create a structure in the form, um, but allow that structure to be flexible, right? So you're going to have to modify things as you go along because you're going to find things that you weren't expecting to find. For example, you might, for example, uh, you might have started with standard error as a column, but then you realize that some of the studies have standard so you're going to have to modify the form to allow for that. And try to avoid free text wherever possible, because it's just a lot easier to, to code things otherwise and also to reanalyze them. Um, build your form and extract a few studies, pilot it, and then go back and test it and make sure that that's working. And then make sure in the end that if you've changed something halfway through, then you go back to the original studies and, and update those. Um, Develop a protocol for handling um, ambiguities, data conversions, and missing data. Um, and so some of the tools that you might use here, um, you could use pen and paper, um, probably not very ideal because it's hard to systematize and computerize. Um, you could use Word, Excel, and Google Docs. There are better systems around. Um, so we have, again, we have a tool called Systematic Review Data Repository that you can download from our website. Um, which is free, and it allows you to create data extraction forms. It also allows you to store data in a database, which um, we were hoping at one time people would put their systematic reviews data in there, and so other people could use it, but it hasn't been as successful as we hoped. There's also Covidence, Distiller, Epi Reviewer. There's a bunch of other products out there that can help you do this as well. So um, again, there's systems out there to, to, to simplify this process. So I'll say a little bit about the systematic review data repository. We've developed it over the last 10 years or so. Um, it aims to make it easier for researchers to extract, manage, and store data. Um, it's got customizable extraction forms, searchable forms. Um, it allows you to share the project across different users because it's web-based. So you can have different people extracting, and then you can combine it all together in the end. Um, it allows you to store the data for future reviews. So if you, for example, are doing a review uh, on a certain topic, and you're going to do a related review on a, on a related topic, and you might want to use some of the information. You can transfer things back and forth 
uh, and it's free and open source. So here's a, here's a screenshot of what it looks like. So here um, you have your title and key questions, um, and then you have various tabs which tell you um, the, the publications related, what are, what's, what are the various aspects of the design, the arms, the arm details, the baseline data, the outcomes, the outcome details, the adverse events and the quality. And then you can have these little, you can make these little pull down boxes to answer questions. So for example, does this extraction form deal with test performance, yes or no? Um, and so the user you know, can only answer one of those questions. And so you know that there's some quality control in that. All right, so you know, the D here is for the, these are all the PICO elements of the, um, of the different forms. Um, so the publications tab gives you bibliographic information about the study. Um, the adverse events tells you any harms. Uh, the quality relates to the quality of research and risk of bias, which we'll get to after, uh, after the break. Um, you have details on randomization, blinding, and selective reporting. Um, and then at the end, um, once you've created the form, um, you can finalize it. You might have piloted it out, and you can share it with everybody, and then everybody can start extracting data into it. Um, now, you might not need a fancy system like that if you've um, certain circumstances. Um, so, I mean, one of the things you need with these web-based things is you need internet access, so you may not have that. If your review is really simple, if you're comfortable with your reviewers, you don't want to have to do a lot of checking. So you can create a data extraction form in Excel, put headings of data elements in the top row, include a tab with instructions or a separate extraction manual. But the problem, of course, is that you, know, you, you have more potential for error because you don't have as much control over things. Um, so there's version control issues when you have multiple reviewers uh, updating things and doing different uh, extractions. It's time consuming to merge and conduct a consensus and it's prone to error. Um, especially if there's more than two reviewers. And there's a lot of ways you can accidentally delete or scramble data. And so here's an example of one that we did a while ago. Um, you can see the different um, uh, columns there. Um, and so, you know, this is a fairly simple one with just a few, if you just got a few studies and you've got a few pieces of information, um, you don't want to do anything fancy, this might work fine. Here we used a new file for each study and extractor. Um, so you can't have two extractors working on the same project at the same time and then have to combine the information from each sheet at the end, so it gets a little cumbersome. Um, so at our center, we typically use SRDR or Excel. Um, you can use other tools, as I mentioned. Um, you could design your own software. You could use simple pad and paper. Um, Technology makes the job easier, but it won't do the work for you. And basically, any approach is going to be successful as long as you're thoughtful and organized. The problem is that a lot of times people are new at the game, and they're not really aware of the mistakes that they can make. And so it's a lot easier to make mistakes if you have a tool that actually uh, doesn't have a lot of structure to it. Right, so this is just to review that data item we looked at where um, we saw that you know, different types of um, counts were reported uh, for different, actually every sentence here kind of gives you a different account and study. And so that's a problem. So, you know, there's other cases where, as I said, you could have an estimate, but there's no measure of variance or confidence interval. Um, so you might exactly have studies where you have usable data, but you don't have all the usable data you need. And so there's various things in the literature you can do uh, or, or that have been suggested um, for, or in, you're basically interpolating or imputing um, some of these numbers. Um, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, but um, just be aware of the fact that extraction, you may find a lot of missing information. So you want to differentiate unclear or missing data from incomplete data extraction. For example, you know, if you just leave something blank, if you're using Excel, it's not clear whether you haven't done that yet or you, you, you looked at it and there wasn't any information available. Um, and there's other cases where you're gonna be looking at quality items and you're not really sure whether it's yes or no and you really should record unclear as, as another item. Um, 
once you've done that, you're still going to have some items that you're not really sure about. So you, as, I, as we said before, you should follow up with, your, with, other, with the authors of the papers for clarification or missing information. If you can't get better information, which is often the case, then um, you, know, you have some choices. You could either leave things blank and treat them as missing, or you can use statistical tools to try to impute or approximate. Um, you try to make sure that the approximations that you use are used consistently for similar scenarios and, and report what you've done and which ones you imputed and which ones you didn't. And then consider sensitivity analyses to assess the impact of the approximations. So what if I analyze the data with the imputations? What if I analyze the data without? What if I imputed in this way? What if I imputed in that way? Hopefully all these answers are, are fairly similar. Um, you know, again, I'm working on uh, a couple of projects. But we, we, we were using this outcome recording bias uh, tool, and we had a bunch of studies, a few of which um, did not report the outcomes. And so we assumed that they had some reporting bias, and we did the answer both with and without them. And it turned out the answers were very similar. So we can be fairly sure there that the, the reporting bias is not having as big an effect. All right, so we want to make sure that we note any cases of ambiguous, incomplete, or in inaccurate data when we're looking at the study quality, which we'll talk about next. Um, so again, it's a two-person job. You should always do this in duplicate if you can. Um, ensures that you don't miss anything or extract an error, and make sure that your subjective decisions are assessed consistently. Um, ideally, you should have some sort of a methods or statistician person and then a subject matter expert. It's good to have and an experienced and inexperienced person just so that things aren't missed. For example, the statistician might not know um, certain things about the subject matter that the subject matter person might be able to get better and vice versa. Um, at the minimum, you want to have these people um, at the beginning designing the extraction form and coming up with the rules so that everybody extracts things the same way. And then you want to train and monitor your extractors, ideally before extraction, do some pilot rounds but at least during the initial stages. At Brown, we oftentimes use students for this. Um, we typically have students that we train and then we keep using them, but sometimes when they start, they're, they're very new at it, and so we have you know, a particular way of training them to make sure that they you know, know what they do and make sure that there's an experienced person looking over it um, in case they've made a mistake. You know, so this is, just as an example, it's a little hard to see, but how two different reviewers might have extracted things, and so, they're pretty similar up top, but then at the bottom, the, the reviewer B um, actually re recorded a lot more about depression than reviewer A. Now, this could be because they extracted a lot of information they didn't need to, but it also might mean that reviewer A just missed a lot, right? And so you, it's good to have two people doing it, and then you can compare results and, and figure out which way to do things. It's important to use a clear protocol. So we want to make it easy as possible for reviewers to follow the same data extraction protocol. Um, you, you want to have a clear and organized form with explicit definitions of variables and the data to be collected and explicit instructions for interpretations um, or, or manipulations of the data. For example, if you're going to turn a standard error into standard deviation, you should have rules about how you do that and everybody should be clear on how to use them. And check in with each reviewer frequently to ensure that they're doing things appropriately. So in particular, if you're getting duplicate extraction, it's a good idea to compare them every once in a while to make sure that people are extracting things. Because you might find that a couple of items are just getting very extracted very inconsistently, and you might need to change those. So a lot of you should have changed those at the beginning rather than at the end. So ideally, you want to have two people extract each study independently, compare your results and iron out inconsistencies, and have a third person resolve any inconsistencies. Um, and that's typically going to be a more senior person. Um, practically, you might have one person extract each study and use another reviewer to kind of spot check. So you might say, well, they're going to look at 10% and make sure that they're OK. And if, if there aren't any errors, um, you know, we'll, we'll say that's OK. Or maybe there's only errors on a couple questions. So we'll have that person look at those couple questions. And obviously, how, how big your analysis or your review is, how much time you have and the resources you have are going to play a role in in which of these you, you decide to do. All right, so some parting words. Develop outlines of the, of the tables you want, right? So if you want a table, a, the typical table one, which would say for each study, what were the design, what was the average characteristics of the people in the study and all that, once you've laid that out, you know that you need to extract all those items. 
identify the items you need and group them logically um, so that people would, don't have to jump all over the place abstracting them. Uh, develop optimal and clear questions that lead to complete, accurate, and rigorous data. Um, develop paper-based extraction forms for doc documentation and their use. Pilot test them, revise them as appropriate, hopefully computerize them um, to make sure that you know they're easy to do and, 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 and you don't lead to transcription errors. The other thing with computerization is you can put in quality checks, like for example, you can make sure that the average age for the study of people in the study um, can't be any less than 20 or greater than 100. And if you enter a number, the wrong number, like you put in an extra zero, it tells you there's an error there. Um, <clears throat> revise them as appropriate and then develop a plan to monitor the quality and progress of, of the extraction so that you make sure in the end you get good data. Um, you want a robust uh, process that minimizes error, forms that are easy to use, results in complete and unambiguous data, and you have independent duplicate uh, data extraction. Okay, I wanted to get to that before lunch. Any questions? Everybody's hungry, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah, it, do, it does do that. We've actually got a new version of it out, so um, I think there's a, I think there's a, a video up there that shows you how to, how to use it. Well, you know, I, I have not used it, my, I don't typically extract data myself, I haven't really used it that, that much, so I don't, I, I'm not gonna swear on everything it can do. But I mean, yeah, you can you can basically set up the questions you want and, and tabs you want, and, and and most of these things, yeah, you can customize boxes and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. So the, so there's um, as I recall, the the thing is you can you can set it up in various ways. Um, so it's either just sort of restricted to your to your own unit, or you you allow people from outside. So there's a way to set that up. Yeah, and I think it's it's on like some sort of you know protected server of the data. Again, again they can tell you at the and I'm sure it tells you at the website exactly what's you know what those protections are. But but since it's done for government research, it's it's you know it's actually hosted at a government site too. So they're, they're very careful. Okay, all right. So what's, what's our, what are our marching orders? <laughs>